Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tommy Valentine. I don't, uh, despite yours working one, I don't really know how to hold a mic, so this will uh, hopefully suffice. Uh, we want to welcome you all so much to Historic Athens. I see a lot of familiar faces. If this is your first time in Old Fire Hall number two, we welcome you. Uh, we want you to know that uh, we are very excited about tonight's proceedings. Uh, tonight is a night for Athens to consider both the past, present, and future of our community. Uh, we wanted to start with a short introduction of our organization, um, and then we are going to pass things over to our excellent moderator, who we'll introduce in just a moment. My name is Tommy Valentine. I serve as the executive director of Historic Athens. Historic Athens is a 55-year-old 501c3 education advocacy nonprofit. We work to celebrate and conserve the community heritage of Athens, Georgia. Um, oftentimes, you see us engaging in work known as historic preservation or heritage conservation, um, and that includes working to save some of the most important built parts of our environment, homes, neighborhoods, uh, historic districts. But we also work to preserve, uncover, celebrate, and educate on the full story of the Athens, uh, the Athens story, Athens history. Uh, we are constantly working to improve on that. You probably know stories and nooks and cr crannies of Athens that we're still learning about. Uh, but that's why this is not a, it's not a one-person nonprofit. This is a organization that has an audience of approximately 12,000 people. Uh, locally based here in Athens, Georgia. Uh, we have about 300 dues-paying members who we are very grateful for, including our sponsors. And so tonight, uh, we will be live streaming so that uh, those that were not able to secure tickets to this sold-out event are going to be able to watch from the comfort of their home. Uh, I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge a few folks in the room. If you are a member, sponsor, or a uh, a member of our trustees. If you just raise your hand for just a moment. Okay, thank you. The, as I said, this is a year-round mission. 55 years in, we're not done, uh, and we know that there's a lot of work to do. Tonight's questions are gonna concentrate primarily on issues of historic preservation, local history, and uh, cultural community heritage. So uh, I, we do wanna let you know that because we were really interested not in gotcha moments, but in carefully considered positions of these candidates, all questions were submitted to the candidates more than a week in advance. However, there's only about eight questions in each forum that are prescribed, and so as time allows, our moderator will turn to you, the audience, and solicit you for questions. Now, it's candidates, y'all. So uh, folks have things to say. They're running for a reason. We may not get to those additional questions, but it may not be a bad idea to keep one in the back of your mind if it's something that you'd like to share with the audience. Okay. Um, I want to uh, take for a moment and um, take our microphone. I didn't acknowledge our staff. You've met a lot of our uh, interns for SPIA, so let's hear for our interns. Um, Historic Athens is very proud to um, focus on paid internships only, and, and that's supported through uh, UGA SPIA. Um, also our staff, uh, if you're a member of our staff, I know we have some outside, raise your hand, staff, 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 staff. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in, addition to, in addition to our core education advocacy nonprofit, Historic Athens, we also operate the Historic Athens Welcome Center, which, uh, how many thousands a year? 9,000 people a year, that's their first touch point into Athens, Georgia. Um, we have Caitlin from the Welcome Center, Michelle from the Welcome Center. You met Jody outside, who works with Hands On Historic Athens, which provides direct home repairs to low to moderate income individuals in historic homes, often seniors living by themselves. Um, and our newest employee, who I'm going to be passing the microphone to, uh, is Hope Eigelhart. Hope is our, you can, let's hear it for Hope. <laughs> Hope is a longtime grassroots community advocate. Uh, she was working in preservation well before uh, I got here and uh, was uh, largely responsible for the preservation of the first African-American historic uh, district here in Athens, Georgia. She was part of our organization when we were known as Athens Park Heritage Foundation. She is now our director of engagement in African-American heritage. And I wanted to pass the microphone to her so she can just introduce herself to you and talk a little bit more about the organization. Welcome, everyone. It is an honor and privilege to be with you here tonight. 
And we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Um, one of the things that I would like to expound upon tonight is that Historic Athens focuses on public programming for our community. And that includes each and every one of you. Um, my position was created to have a richer, fuller experience in telling our story as not as just one Athens, but bringing the fabric of Athens together. And so with that, I'm gonna turn that back over to Tommy Valentine. All right, um, we do wanna emphasize as a 501c3, uh, remember, uh, yes, we're nonpartisan. Uh, we, are, we do not engage in endorsements or campaign activity, but we are able to provide things like this in the forthcoming voter guide that's gonna be produced from our candidate questionnaire as voter education. As part of that voter education, we do wanna urge you when you go to the ballot box to support TSPLOS this year. We have a signature project there that would allow us to increase historic district signage um, around the county, um, including for our next two historic districts, which we're hoping will be part of telling a fuller story. So uh, with that said, uh, we are dependent on your support. Um, Hope's salary was paid through a one-year grant provided by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but it's a seed grant. Um, Hope has already proven an irreplaceable part of our team, but for the sake of Hope and for our ongoing operations, we need more members and sponsors. Um, you can visit today from your phone, historicathens.com forward slash join to support programming like this and um, ensuring that we're taking an equitable approach to local heritage conservation. Um, with that said, um, someone who's been, uh, we mentioned we're 55 years old. Uh, the, our moderator today was with us for 17 of those years. He is one of the, if not the longest serving trustee in our organization's history. Uh, he is a past president of the Historic Athens Board of Trustees, um, a well-known community figure, and the perfect person to moderate fairly tonight's proceedings. Let's hear it for Marvin Nunley. <laughs> Let me say good evening to everyone. We want to just say, first of all, thank you for sacrificing your time. This would not be possible. Historic Athens wouldn't be possible without you, 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 and you being here. As I look across the room and see some of my fellow board members who were on the board with me when I served here and people who've been out there fighting in the community for historic preservation here in Athens, Georgia, uh, I tell you, I, it's just a joy, Walter, to see them out there. And like this beautiful lady over here, Rosemary Gooden, that's my sweetheart. Give her a hand, y'all. Please give her a hand. Yes, yes. So, Without further ado, let's, you know, we're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to have a good, if you got an empty seat, raise your hand. We got two over here, three over here. So if you want to come take a seat, please come take a seat, come take a seat. So with our, uh, let's go ahead and get our candidates to come on down, please. I've got Mr. Mark Evans, if you come down. Mr. Tim Denson, would you come on down? Elder Johnson and Heidi Hensley, would you all please come on down? Come on down. See uh, James Alexander as well. Mr. Alexander, is he here? Did Mr. Alexander make it in? I hope you've got those. Yeah, might need those. Howdy, good to see you. Great, great. Now, I'm ready to have a good time tonight, folks, okay? I, I truly hope and pray that you all are ready because we're going to come at you, okay? All right, can we do that? Now, let me just say, when I think of Board of ed Education, I think it's so integral to have people who are, have the children the children at state. 
So that's, that's, that's my backdrop. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I have a heart for kids, and I work with a youth group for the last 10 years, and so I am an advocate with several different school districts, and sh I show up and ask a lot of questions. So once again, I'm going to take this out and move this up to the side there. Now, so what we'd like to do, I would like to take a quick moment for each one of you to, you know, just kind of real, in one minute or less, introduce yourself. We're going to start with Ms. Heidi. COVID hit, I decided I wanted to give back to the community. I'm an artist. I became the art teacher of Hillsman Middle School, which I have done for the past two years. Um, I run a business in town, and I decided that it was time for me to focus on my business, but I did not want to not be involved in the education system of Clark County, and that's why I am running for district court. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? My name's Elvin Johnson. I'm 36 years old. I had a birthday yesterday. All right. Oh. Mr. Denson? Tim? Yeah, uh, I'm Tim Denson. I am uh, currently a uh, Clark County County Commissioner, but will not be running for County Commissioner for the next school board. And I have uh, my wonderful daughter, goes to White Hills Elementary School right now, the little okay. koala. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'm running because uh, I really want to support the students, the families, the parents, and the teachers and staff. I think that uh, the Clark County School District has faced a lot of challenges uh, for a myriad of reasons. Thank you. Mr. Evans? My name is Mark Evans. I'm a professor of education at Piedmont University. Um, so I've been well entrenched in education for the past 20 years on all aspects. Uh, I was a K-12 teacher. Uh, I was a grad student at the University of Georgia. Um, I uh, owned a, a, an educational software business here in town. And uh, I am running because I can see the future. And there are lots of things that are coming down the pike that we're not really addressing. And we need to <coughs> desperately. Um, so uh, that's why I'm running. And thank you for having us here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get directly into the question. Now, keep in mind, candidates, tonight's questions are geared toward historic preservation. Dala, where we at? Historic Athens. So for all the candidates, keep that in mind, OK? All right? So if you don't answer it, Historically, I'm going to call you. I'm going to go, bump. Okay. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> okay. So we're going to have a good time tonight. Number one, and I like to ask each uh, candidate answers in less two minutes or less. Is that correct? All right. Here we go. All right. Ms. Hensley, what is your favorite historic site, building, or neighborhood in Athens, and what is your personal connection to it? Um, tells a lot about how Athens was built and our culture. Um, 
um, I think that it says that it's a, it's a testament to who, how the community actually was built. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd definitely say the Morton Theater. I it, This isn't really geared towards education, but it is education because I do feel like kids need to understand the cultural history of Clark County, and the Morton Theater played such a critical part in that. Um, we had jazz and blues musicians that came to Athens, Georgia that, that we need to learn about and know about. Um, it's a critical part, I think, of the liberal arts piece of what we need to teach our kids. Um, so I'm going to have to go with the Morton Theater. She stole mine, but I got more than one. Uh, more in theater, of course, but uh, growing up, I had a best friend. His dad, uh, his granddad actually was the owner of Wilson's Barbershop. So I always went down there, got my hair cut, and I had hot meals uh, from Wilson's Restaurant, which is now um, the, uh, what's it, the world famous. Um, but that, that whole area, Hot Corner, uh, I spent timeless amounts of time down there as a childhood um, and it's not just the structures the the murals on the in that area depict the story along with the structure and I think that's very important to emphasize not just on the buildings but the stories behind it you know the sacrifices that were made you know the time spent the blood the sweat the tears like she said uh, the performances not just the performances I remember I was in a program um, early childhood called creative visions and we uh, I was involved in a lot of productions at the Morton Theater, so it's kind of near and dear to me. I'm a part of it, you know. It's kind of near and dear to me personally, um, but not just the Morton Theater specifically. That whole area downtown, Athens High Corner. Thank you, and man, I know, like Tommy said, they all sent the questions to us earlier. So I've been thinking about this one. It's hard. It's really hard. I mean, there's so many amazing places. Um, I think I could say a different one with every single answer. Um, I, I think uh, just what, what's, what's speaking to me right now is I would say um, the Brick Factory at Sandy Creek Nature Center. I don't know how many of y'all have gone there. It's a hidden one, I think. Um, and it's amazing because right, you go to these places, no matter if it's the Morton, no matter if it's Wilson's, the Brick Factory, or any of our historic neighborhoods, that history is there. You get to, you get to interact with it. Even for just a moment, you get to actually imagine what this was like. Um, you walk through the brick, brick factory ruins where they are ruins, like everything's fallen over, although you'll be just wandering through a, down a trail and you'll just come across these random bricks. And it's so amazing. You can get in touch with like somebody made that brick. Like who knows generations ago built this thing. And then these bricks were taken and, and made into the buildings and the roads that we have here in our community. Um, and and, and it, it's really amazing. And that's why it's so important for us to be holding on to those things so that we can interact with us, not just us, but in the future. Because I think another important thing that, like, the history, we get to think back in the past, but it also reminds us that we are creating the present, which in the future will be the past. And so what are we doing there that other people coming after me will think about, too? So. Well, as a historian, when I got this question, it was like, well, which is your favorite child? <laughs> um, and, and, and so I really had to think about... And for the work that, that I do um, on a professional level, you know, the area that we're in right now, uh, Hill Street, we're, we're talking about a corridor of power that affected a nation, that affected an in, not only just this community, but on up and, and, and dealt with uh, different <clears throat> people and places. Um, so yeah, this is, this is my place right here, um, you know, the Cobham area. And uh, the other ones are, are, are just as fine. Like I said, it was just like trying to pick my own child. Um, but, I, you know, if I had to pick a spot, this would be it, this area right here. So what is your philosophy on local history? What is your philosophy? Ooh, uh, so that's a whole class. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but I got, I got two minutes, so uh, let, let, me, let me try it. My, my philosophy is that history belongs to the public. It belongs to all of us, right? We don't have a dictator who tells us how our past was or how it should be. It belongs to all of us. And we need to have representation in there. We need to be able to take a look at the different places and have an understanding of all of the people that were there. And so um, my philosophy is, is that we can do more with public history. We should do more. 
Um, as a charter system, we do nothing with pu public history. And that is a crying shame. When I watch what other counties do with their charter, um, we, we sit here, I, honestly, I can't tell the difference between what uh, Atlanta Public Schools is doing and what we're doing. It's the same stuff, right? We need to take the bull by the horns and begin really focusing on some of the aspects of our history and making it accessible to our children. In fact, have our children have a deeper understanding of the locality and community that they live in. Same question, all right, making sure. Um, yeah, I think my philosophy here is that you have to be thinking about this, that our history guides so much. It guides our decision-making going forward. It guides how we um, digest uh, our world around us and our community, how we see our community. Um, and it's extremely important. And I think one of the biggest problems that we've had is that uh, we've had here in Athens and across the United States and across the world, uh, we've had a lot of history um, preserved that has been of wealthy white men. And that creates uh, the way that people interact with, the, with their world around them. That feeds into that. Uh, it, 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 in some ways, oftentimes glorifies it. And it kind of puts it on a pedestal. While the history of, of you know, the black communities and the indigenous communities and, and, and the brown communities here, and then also of women, and especially also of, 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 of you know, lower wealth people, it's forgotten. And it's not glorified. And it's not taken into the way that we digest and interact with the world. And those people oftentimes are forgot about and looked at lesser so than by the entire society. Um, and so I think it's uh, preserving history, and, and especially whenever you're given uh, you know, the, the, the seats that, that we're all running for here now, where you are given some power to actually to do that. I mean, we are given the responsibility of preserving the history. And so it's extremely important about whose history are we going to be really prioritizing when we're given those opportunities to? Um, and I think in the past, there's been a lot of errors all across every single level of government and authority and power. Um, and so and it makes it difficult, right? Because then it makes it even more fragile that a lot of that history that I said has been forgotten, a lot of it's gone. A lot of it's, a lot of it's been burned away and destroyed. So the, the, the bits that are left, we really need to, in an equitable way, prioritize those parts um, because there's not a lot left right now. Thank you. Um, when I got this question, first thing I did was I just jotted down the definition of history. And I got two definitions. The first one was history is a study of past events, particularly in human affairs. And the second one was the whole of past events. Um, and the, what my philosophy is, and the reason I went to the definition is because uh, something stuck out to me in that second definition, and it was the whole of past events. And I think that's something that we're not privy to here in athens Clark County. We're just getting a, a short, condensed story or a summarization or, you know, we're definitely not getting the full whole story. Uh, 40, some 41 years ago, a man by the name of Michael Thurman wrote a, wrote a book called The Untold Story. And it was a... Uh, compilation of essays uh, just depicting life in the history of uh, local Athenians, black men and women. Um, and I thought it was uh, very interesting that he entitled that book The Untold Story because it couldn't be any more true. Um, and that happened 41 years ago. And if you were to ask the average student here, a high school student in, in Clark County in 2022, uh, are they familiar with Michael Thurman and his book? They probably would tell you no. And so uh, I think that speaks volumes, you know, when we talk about the philosophy of local history. It's so much history that is just a story untold, and I think that's important that we go back and, and we embrace the whole story uh, of, of Athens, and it's important that we build awareness and, and educate ourselves about it so that we can pass those stories along so they won't be untold stories. And 41 years is a long time, you know, for someone to, you know, just go without notice or recognition. And I think we need more untold stories to be brought to the mainstream. I think when I look at the, uh, my philosophy of Athens, Georgia, I think it's a mainstream history and then it's a, like an underground history. And I think that shouldn't be so. I think everyone should be aware of every, all the sacrifices that were made uh, for this classic city. Great, they, they've taken everything. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, it's, this is hard to be the last person on this one, but I, I agree with all of my panel mates. Um, and in addition to that, I would say that history is what creates every one of us. Like it's, it's like, a, I'm gonna go to art or music. It's like the, the foundation, it's the base, it's the painting. It's, it's, it's the, the backdrop of where we're going, where we've been. Um, part of the reason I think history is so important, um, especially in Clark County, and, and part of the reason I think it's important in education and, and, and in selecting our next superintendent is that they understand the history of Athens, Georgia, and that we have a better understanding of the history of Athens, Georgia. And not just our history, our present, but our history is what cre has created our present, right? Um, and it's critical and it's important. And the different facets, you know, Athens is a very unique place to be because we have so many different cultural facets that have moved into this town. We have the University of Georgia. We have um, our black history. We have, um, you know, we have old farming history in Athens, Georgia. It's agricultural history here. Um, and it's just similar to what you're saying, things, stories that are not told. And I think it is critical that we all come together and understand our, where we're from isn't that everybody wants to know where we came from, where, where our basis is. And I think it's, it's important in education, especially telling our kids, like, this is where you came from. This is where you live. These are the people that, that basically have, have form, formulated your, your surroundings. And that goes into, like, buildings, everything, you know, architecture, um, places, historic places, historic parks. Um, I, I'll go back to the music again, the Morton Theater and how important it was and how important that music was to the culture and the history of this town. Um, the arts, all of it. So I think it is critically important and they pretty much hit on everything else. Great. So what role do you see historic preservation playing in your election? Once again, what role do you see historic preservation playing in your elected position? Well, again, I'll go back to the education of it. Um, there's a lot of talk about, there's a lot of talk about history and true history, I guess, for lack of a better word. I, I don't want to hit a sensitive topic here. But there's a lot of talk about um, what's, what's being talked about and what's not being talked about. And I think in education, um, knowing the facts of where you come from, knowing the facts of how a community was built, knowing the facts of what what the basis of this community was, is critically, critically important to the education of our children. Like we need to be able to tell them truths and un understand and, and honesty. Not not that it's all bad. It's we have beautiful history too, but just understanding all the history of our culture and where we've come from. And again, there's such a diverse population in this county that I think it's important to know back to my, what I answered earlier, to know the basics of where we come from in order to educate and move forward in education. I also think on, a, on an art level, you know, not, not just art, but on an art level and a, a, a cultural, multicultural level, there's so much that has happened in athens Clark County that isn't talked about, from musicians to artists to um, inventors to, to all kinds of agriculture that has come out of athens Clark County. And it's really critical and important, like it's something to be proud of. And, and kind of instilling that in our students and in our education system, I think, gives them a sense of like, this is where I'm from. It's ownership of, of who we are and what, where we came from. Um, the role that historic preservation plays on the school board. Um, well, aside from building awareness, I believe uh, probably over half of the students, if you were to ask them one fact about the person that their school was named after, they probably could not come up with a, a, a correct answer. Um, so aside from just building awareness, I think the school board uh, can also help identify and expand the significance of local historical buildings um, in, in efforts to uh, foster a more uh, inclusive environment. Uh, take Barrow Elementary, for example. Um, growing up, I heard more about Booker T. Washington than I did about John C. Barrow. Uh, but as I became an adult and, and doing research, investigating, I found out a lot of information about Mr. Barrow. You know, he was a chancellor at the Board of Georgia Regents, um, and he was a chancellor for life. Um, and then, aside from his educational uh, accomplishments, uh, he was good friends with Booker T. Washington. And 
Uh, upon request of Booker T. Washington, he actually joined the Jeans Fund for uh, rural education to help rural, uh, rural African Americans uh, ex ex excel in education. And so I, when I go, when I mention the whole story, that's part of the whole story that is, that part was untold. And so I think, you know, that building that awareness, giving kids something to identify with in, in all cultures, all races, you know, across the board, you know, it goes back to, hey, I know what John, John Barrow did, and not just he's the name of my school, you know, I can identify with something that he did that had a direct impact on my community. So I think it's very important. Yeah, uh, the way historic preservation, I think, that can play in with uh, the elected position of school board is, um, I mean, one of the most obvious ones is being stewards of all of the Clark County School District properties and the historic nature of those properties. Um, so that, that, that you know, that's, I think that's one step. Uh, obviously, uh, situations around the West Broad School, we, I think that was a big example that you could see of, of how historic preservation interacts with, uh, with this elected position. And so I think that's, that's one, that we are the stewards to protect and preserve that and, and also ensure that it is uh, being presented accurately uh, to the community and also in a way where people can engage and interact with it. Um, I think the other part of this is, right, is like, you know, history, history and education are tied together. Uh, how, you, how, you, how you share that history, how you, how you communicate it um, is an educational component. And so I think there's that whole part of it, too, is like, how can Clark County School District find ways, and I understand it has, it has to be very creative ways because of all of the, uh, the limitations that are put there about what has to be taught and what at this time is being told can't be taught and such, but still finding creative ways that we could be sharing that history of Athens, Clark County, of Georgia, in a way that's not being presented right now to the students of Clark County School District. Um, you know, in, in the past... Uh, we have we have a lot of historic buildings right around us here, you know, the, the Cobb House, the Taylor Grady House. But again, those those places present a, a very specific slice of history, and I think the opportunity is just as much there that we could be sharing the history of of Linnentown or of uh, again the, the indigenous nations that of, that gathered around the spring that UJ is built upon. Uh, that that was uh, was a gathering place for indigenous people. These things could also be and should be shared. Uh, and so I think that uh, being in this position, uh, you know, finds, uh, puts a situation there where we can try to find creative ways that we can actually try to get that history communicated to our children. Yeah, it's terrible being last. <laughs> you know, because the, the, I know they, they, they took all of my good points, but I, I, I will say that you know, as an elected official, one of the things that, that you have to do is, is you have to find balance. And my, my son goes to Whitehead Road Elementary, go Koalas, and, and my daughter goes to BHL, Bernie Harris Lions out there, and um, Whitehead Road Elementary School, the original one is gone. It's just gone. Everything's, it's erased. It's, it's as if there was nothing there. Now, they, they, they left the one Quonset hut there for some sort of board, uh, you know, I, I guess that's where if you're bad, that's where they stick you. Um, so I'll probably have my office there because um, uh, I, I will meet challenges head on. And, um, you know, uh, it, as an elected official, you, you have to make hard choices and and you have to be able to say, no, we're not going to get rid of this particular building because it has such an important historic idea to this community. Right? And the idea in education right now, the biggest fad is new is better, right? New is great. We're just going to knock everything down and we're going to rebuild. And I'm not, you know, uh, Whitehead Road is a beautiful school. Oglethorpe Avenue, beautiful school. But what do we lose? Like when you want to have your 25th reunion, can you? No, because that school's gone. You know, and so part of what we need to do as elected officials, right, is weigh what is best for our community, and not just the community now, but the community in the past and the community that's coming forward.
how will you ensure that the FEMA, these properties, will stick around? So this is where the charter is important. Um, and again, if you haven't read the, the, the charter for uh, Clark County, you really should. Um, and we have an untapped resource called our history teachers and our teachers in general. And we can empower them to do a lot of that research. In fact, you know, the things that I do at, at my position right now at the university uh, is, you know, getting teachers ready to do that sort of work because that's what's important. And, you know, so what I would do is I would clear the way for uh, teachers to be able to do that type of work. And then we can take that work and we can do lots of things with it. I mean, we could turn it over to Historic Athens, for instance, and let them run the ball. So that way uh, we can get some markers up there and maybe declare some historical sites. I mean, there are all sorts of things that we can do that we just don't. And the reason we don't is we just haven't had the political will to do it. And we need board members who are going to show that political will and are going to say, hey, this is what's best for athens Clark County. And uh, that's, that's what I plan to do. Yeah, I think that the key part is that we have to be able to accurately recognize and understand the value of preserving historic buildings that are, that are controlled by Clark County School District. Uh, when we're talking about growth and having to build new schools, build new facilities, right, there's a lot of priorities that we have to deal with there. A lot of, and a lot of sometimes they're, conf they're conflicting. Uh, we have to think about safety. We have to think about cost effectiveness. We have to think about longevity. And those things are valued and oftentimes have a, a, a dollar amount put onto them. You know, we can actually, we can, vary, we, we can find out very quickly how much is it going to cost us to build a school on this property with this many classrooms with this capacity. It's a lot harder to come up with the, the cost and the value of what a school that's been around for generations that, uh, that had so many of our people of, of this community go through it. it. It's hard to find the value of keeping that and what that is. It's hard to put a dollar amount on that. And so I think that's one of the big challenges. And I think that anybody who's on the school board is having to take that on of like, how can we really come up with that value and, and place that? Because I, and, and until we recognize that, um, if, and if we don't recognize that, well, then you're going to keep on having old schools torn down and new ones built. Because it's very easy to understand the dollars and the numbers behind that. But again, as Mark said, what do we lose there? And I think we lose quite a bit. So we're going to have to go about this, I think, in a, in a new way when we are talking about expansion of the schools and, and building new schools. How can we preserve these things? I mean, any of us who have walked on, gone to, to the West, West Broad and you walk into uh, the, the, the atrium area there and you see those ceramic faces that were made by students who went there and how they make this amazing art. And those are the faces of, of children who, who live here and grew up here. That you can't put a dollar that you can't put a dollar amount on that. You can't put a cost savings on that of tearing that down and building up a new school instead. So we have to find that value. It's going to be tough, but it, that's that's what this job comes with. Uh, one of the ways, well, I believe children are the future. I believe that the, the kids uh, before they graduate high school, whether through the school district itself or just on their own, or groups or organizations, these every child needs to visit all 44 landmarks, all 16 districts, so they understand what significance is, so they understand what the history actually is. Uh, the children are their future. At 10, 10 for 20 years from now, the high school students are gonna be sitting right here giving answers as to how they're gonna preserve something that they probably don't even know about right now. And so I think it starts as, as low as we can go on a totem pole and build our way up. Uh, I, I intend on to listen to the, the stakeholders, uh, do my research, uh, use discretion, pray about it, and use my vote. Take a stance on something and, and stick to it. And but consider all of the all of the perspectives. And um, uh, like my colleague said over here on the end, you know, we have to really understand, uh, you know, the significance of it, and and we have to we have to. Um, just basically, we can't erase a history. And so we have to, by any means, I would preserve before we tear down. We could, 
we could turn some of these buildings to museums. We we could look at what it was originally used for and try to tie it into that. But if there's no way possible or feasible, then we still could at least keep the exterior structure and just completely renovate it and turn it into a grocery store on the inside. Or just consider all of the possibilities before we just say, hey, let's just start demolition. You know, I think it's very important. And if these children have a tie to it, if I know that my, my, my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother all went to this school, then it don't even matter if I don't know nothing about it. I'm, I'm connected to it just because of that history, my lineage tied to that. And it's a lot of that going on right now and people just aren't aware because we're ignorance of some things. I'm going to touch a little bit on what Elder just said. Um, you know, I feel like we need to take these kids to these places. I think until you have been there and you felt it and you've experienced it and you've seen it, it's as not just sitting in classrooms, I think historic preservation is so important and I think our history is important. But bringing that into a classroom, you can bring it into a classroom, but there are students, I don't want to give away my my character, um, Mr. Morton here, but that we'll talk about later, but there are stories within this town, these incredible stories of people who have built our community and being able, I'm, I'm all about hands on. I mean, I'm an art teacher, so I like to get my hands dirty and hands in things. And I think these kids need to be not just hear about the history of our town, but also visit it. We need to make it a part of our curriculum where you, my son did get have an opportunity to go see a play at the Morton Theater, and he was, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go see a play. He's a 14-year-old boy, and I was like, you're getting a piece of our history. The Morton Theater is incredible. Like, do you know the story behind the Morton Theater? And those types of things, but he got to experience that firsthand. So I do think we, we're missing out on, in a, on an opportunity to have these kids actually visit these places and see it, put their hands on it, and feel it. Um, there's an energy... I think you gather from history about being surrounded by it, not just talking about it. And I think that's something we could implement into our school systems, uh, like bringing our history uh, in a hands-on way to our students. Let me ask a question, Ms. Lindsay, if I may. So what are your thoughts on a school-wide, district-wide preservation assessment, assessment of this historic site, and what is your policy? What, what preservation policy would you uh, like to bring forth? Assessment on all the historic sites? Right. Well, the sites within the school, that within the school district. Say that question one more time. I didn't get these questions ahead of time, by the way. District-wide district preservation assessment of historic sites and, pres and the, from that point, a preservation policy. Um, I think a district-wide preservation assessment is important. I think it goes back to what, what you were saying about these buildings and how we're tearing down these buildings. I go back to um, the farmer's market, the, the oldest black school that we were talking about, you know, tearing down and we're going to, you know, these are important things. I think that it is a discussion that needs to be to be made. The second part of that question was implementing a policy. I think there should be policies. I think there should be, just like in any other historic preservation. Um, I worked in architectural design for a while, and I, I know that there are certain rules and, and, and not rules, but like desire, well, they're rules. They're desires and rules about historically preserving an area or an old building. It goes back into that, you know, these again are the hands of people who crafted our history. And we're just going to take that away when it's actually a, another visual and experience that people can have based on our history. I go back to that tangible part. So we should have policies that um, we're, you know, there are certain areas and certain buildings that we don't tear down because it is a vital part of our history and I use that 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 one school as as a good example you know it's this is a vital part of our history so we should have policies in place to maintain that and maintain the architectural and historical um, integrity of these incredible places that we have all right um, considering the assessment I'm 100% for the assessment I think this imperative uh, I think to just to gauge the necessity of uh, preserving it, the significance of it, the impact on the community, how the community responds or feels to uh, renovations or preservations or even demolitions. Uh, however, when it comes to policies, I think we need to be careful, uh, careful about uh, blanket policies. And what I mean by that, uh, every structure has its own story, has its own history um, that may resonate with 
a demographic that may not be in the position to make the decisions of its future. And so when we talk about policies, I think we should do the assessment as a broader thing, but when it comes to policies, we should, you know, minimize the the blanket of policies and look at it individually and uh, consider each individual structure, each individual uh, community, how it would affect it uh, moving forward. So that's that's how I feel about you know the assessment and the policies. Yeah, I I don't believe that you can be a good steward of what you don't understand. And so I think that uh, a historic assessment is absolutely ne absolutely necessary. Uh, I've advocated for it uh, for it countywide through the county government also. I'm hoping that that's something that, that will be budgeted, and I think it also needs to happen with the school district. Um, because, again, we don't actually understand. Sometimes, right, uh, how many of us think about your favorite, right, we had that question, think about your favorite historic building here in athens Clark County, everybody. When did you realize that history? How many times did you drive past that building before you actually even knew what was so amazing or historic about it? A lot of times. I know the same thing with me, because until you understand the history is there, you can't appreciate it. And so it's absolutely necessary that we, we stop, we analyze all the properties that we have, we do an assessment there, have that really, a, a very thorough one, have it understood, and have it in a way that is understood by the school board, that is understood by the, the entire, all the CCSD employees, but also in the entire community, have it be very transparent, open, and a resource to the entire community. And then once we've done that, then we can decide, well, hey, uh, we need a new school in this area, uh, do we tear down this, this school or not? Or do we keep it where it is and really put extra money into preserving that history? Because did you know this about this thing? Look at the, look at the assessment. So I think it's, an, it's a necessary tool, um, and uh, I would definitely support it moving forward. At all the questions, this was the most depressing one to me, because we don't have a policy in 2022 is ridiculous. And, it, and it's absolutely backwards in how we should be presenting our community and how we should be teaching our children. Um, you know, of course, uh, again, as a historian, the one thing we're going to do right off the bat is we're going we're gonna to have to assess, you know, what's what. And then do things with it, you know, I, you know and, and figure out, okay, hey, you know, what can we save? What, what are some of the things that we need to do because of growth? You know, how can we keep the spirit of this building if we can't keep the actual building? What are some things that we can do? You know, uh, you know, one of the perfect examples of that is what they did at the Career Academy. If you go into the boardroom there, you will see um, all of the regalia from the African-American schools that were closed because of desegregation. All that stuff's there. And you can visit it. And when I taught there, and when, I, you know, I would take the students into that boardroom, and it, for them, it was, as, it was as if their eyes were open to a brand new thing. You know, and some of them were like, oh, that's my grandma, you know, and she was the prom queen, you know, um, and, and it's, it's things like that, that, that honestly, we should, we, we shouldn't even really have to be debating about because it should have already been done. So. That's a hard question, but it's a good one because it's important, right? We, we need to be honest with ourselves, right? That in, inside of the school district, there have been forces inside that have, that really don't care about our community. They don't live here. They drive in and they drive out. And so they don't know who we are and they don't care to know who they are. What they care about is their paycheck at the end of the day, right? As a board member, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to do is work with the, with, with the central office and show them why they need to care. Um, you know, uh, the, the buildings that have been raised, you know, let's be honest, they are uh, schools where predominantly 
uh, African American, Latino, and poor white children go. And those communities are, have been silenced for years. And we've done it in a systemic way where it's almost piecemeal and we're like, we're, and we're okay with it. Because that's just how the things go and that's how just things are. Well, if I'm elected, that's just not how it's going to be. All right. You know, we need to protect our history. We need to protect our community. Because when our community loses its history, you're no longer a community. You're vassals. Yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of what we were talking about before, I, th I think that the approach that we've seen with the demolition of some of the schools and the and rebuilding of the schools, um, yeah, like, like you said, Whitehead, I live right next door to Whitehead Rural Elementary School. Uh, it's a beautiful school. It's a wonderful school. Um, but the history has been set aside, a little sliver of it, over in the Southern Hill with the annex. Um, and uh, I've looked up pictures to understand, you know, the history and seeing what it was being. I've talked to uh, neighbors and community members about that, that went to that school who live around the corner from them. They tell me the stories about their old school and stuff that was there. But most of that's gone. And, and, and again, I, I understand, I, I see how that happened. Uh, I've, I've been faced with these same situations as, as, as a county commissioner. Um, uh, the, the cost of building down, downtown that used to be the police station uh, right over next to, um, next to City Hall. Uh, you know, it was put forward to do a whole renovation of that, of that historic building uh, that was part of SPLOS, and we're finally doing it. Like, I got the tour. It looks amazing. But you know what would be a lot cheaper? Just to tear it down and build a new building. You could build it higher. You could build it wider. You could put more amenities in there, all sorts of things. But you'd completely lose that history. And it is more expensive. It is. It's more expensive to build it up in a way that preserves that history. But the thing is that we recognize the value of it. And it's worth that additional cost. And we have to be looking at, when we build these schools, when we have these, these schools that are already there, we have to be looking at it from that dimension. We can't just be looking at how, much is it, how many years is this new, new build going to give us and how much is it going to cost per year. All right, that's cheaper than the one we keep it there. Okay, that's what we do. We have to have a more nuanced discussion there. And we have to find a way, and I think that the assessment is one of those ways that we can do it, we have to find a way to really value the history that's there. Because there's a way to do it both ways. There really is. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take extra work. It's going to take extra money. And, and I think a big thing is, and we have to be intentional about it. You don't preserve this history unless you are intentional about it. Thank you. Um, just like Mr. Denson just said, um, you have to have an importance on the value in order to consider keeping something. If I don't care too much about anything, I'm not going to be that adamant about making sure I keep up with it. Uh, I kind of look at it sort of like this. I, the conversation does need to be had, and it's not just in one ideal thing. A lot of people have different perspectives and opinions, um, but I would much rather see a higher graduation rate out of a subpar facility than a state-of-the-art facility and we have kids that can't read on grade level. Um, and so we have these discussions about, you know, how much money we're going to put into something. And I'm running for school board. I want to see these kids to sell, you know. And, of course, who, who doesn't like a good school, a nice school? I remember I, when I went, I graduated from Cedar Shows in 2004. My first year I spent in the old school. And I remember it, but I'm, I, I cherish that because my mom went to that school. My, and, and her her aunt, my, all my aunts and everybody went to that school. And everybody told me about how you could just – hit the wall and the person next door hit back and yet, but it was like, that was history, but all that's gone now. And it's like, there's no, they could, they could have took something from that school and just all these schools that they're gonna tear down and renovate, I'm, it's good. But in order to preserve something, we need a museum. We need something to where so, people can go back and see a part of their childhood instead of, hey, I remember when this building used to be here and is no longer here. You know, and all we have is memories. You know, our ancestors didn't have Facebook, so they don't even have pictures of a lot of these things. And so preserving it is very important, more so to older people than it is now. You know, we can just take a picture of something and keep it forever. It'll be on a post 10 years from now. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case 20 years ago. And so I think it's very important that, you know, 
in order to value something, we have to see the importance of it. Um, again, I'm at the end. Um, same, touching on what Elder said, you know, he was talking about the schools that his aunt and uncle went to, your auntie and whatever. Um, I have a, a now Cedar Shoals stepdaughter who went to the old building that is now the Early Learning Center over on Gain School Road. And when Hillsman Middle School was built, the brand new middle school, she pined that building. She loved that building with the, the wooden floors and it felt like home and it was secure. Not, I am a firm believer that there's energy in every space we go into um, and we need to preserve that energy. It goes back to the Morton Theater and the feeling I get when I walk in there. Um, it's, not just about, it's not just about brick and mortar, it's not just about the new niceties or whatever. Again, I go back to the history, but it is a feeling. And, and that's something that we don't think about sometimes. And, you know, we're trying to educate these kids, and we're trying to get them on grade level, but you have the social-emotional aspect. You know, Hillsman Middle School has me painting murals all over the school right now because it looks like a hospital. It is so stark, and it's so cold. And I think that's what she loved about that, that old building, that the trailers she had to walk out to sometimes, sure, but those old wooden fo floors that made her feel secure and kind of like you know, nostalgic, nostalgic. It's a feeling and it's important. And I think in education in general, we have taken the, the emotional and the feeling out of it. Like it's not about, it's not about the best building and the best test scores and the best grades and the best whatever. Again, it's about, it's about a feeling and history is such a part of that. And so um, our buildings, I think are critically important. And like you said, even if, if a part of it is restored, you build off of that building, but you still have this historic part. There are ways we can get around, you know, we, we have new codes for schools and whatnot. I, I get it, but there are ways to get around that. And I think it's important. Finally, what one fact or figure inspires you about This is a tough one. Um, I'm just going to go to a figure, and I'm going to I'm going to make this quick because I I don't want to talk too much about him. But um, Monroe Morton, Monroe Morton was raised by a, a slave owner. Um, he came to Athens, Georgia. He started doing a newspaper, and then through that developed a theater. And in that theater, um, the theater was on the top floor. The bottom floors he took other African-American um, entrepreneurs, doctors, one of the first female doctors in the state of Georgia, black female doctors in the state of Georgia had an office there. He took his vision and his passion and his love and he turned it into something that benefited the whole community. He basically created that hot corner in that community. I'm gonna go back to education for a second. That's why when my son went to the Morton Theater and I was like, do you know what that building stands for? Here's this guy who had to go to a secret school just to even have an education, comes to Athens, Georgia, develops a newspaper, builds a building, supplies jobs for, for several of his people, just people he loved, um, his community members, and that's, that's incredible, and it's huge. And that's why that theater is so important. That's important that when we go there and we see a play, that we tell those stories to, to our kids, that they understand where that came from and the importance of it. Because I think if they can see it, he did this, look at what you did, they can do it as well. Um, it just continues that, that history and that, I guess, and I'm going to go again to that emotion and that feeling of being in that building. So I'm going to say um, Monroe Morton would probably be my favorite. Uh, mine was, <clears throat> excuse me, mine's Michael Thurman. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, and the reason why is because um, he grew up with my dad, you know, and so it, he was close to the family. And aside from that, uh, he was intentional about not just education, you know, being a former superintendent here in athens Clark County, um, but authoring a book about, you know, telling a story that was untold, preserving that history, you know, being a voice to the voiceless, you know, that inspires me. It's so many people in my community that, you know, they expect me to be their voice, but, you know, I can only, you know, listen and, and formulate a intelligent uh, conversation for them. Uh, but I, can, I, I can't, I don't have all the words, I don't have all the thoughts, so I have to listen, and God bless me with two ears and one mouth so I can do twice as much listening than I can speaking. Um, but I want, I like to thank 
and, and, and consider my thoughts before I, I speak. And I see that quality in uh, uh, Michael Thurman as well. So that's where I draw my inspiration for, for running for school board. Thank you. Um, I think for this, I, I, would, I would go with, uh, for a figure, um, uh, yeah, um, Miss Hattie Whitehead, um, with who did so much bringing about and, and not letting us forget uh, the history of Town and what happened during urban renewal and really shining a light on it. Um, I see Commissioner Davenport back here. I remember whenever me and Commissioner Davenport sat down uh, the first time with Hattie and Bobby and other residents of Town and, um, you know, heard these stories, saw these pictures. And now if you walk those roads there, which are now just student dormitories off of Baxter Street, just complete erasure, complete erasure. And again, that goes back to we've, in the past, we've intentionally preserved what we wanted to preserve. All right? We can drive up and down Prince Avenue and look around. I mean, there's, there's some old, old buildings. There's some old buildings much older than the houses that, that were there on Linnantown. People, the people in power wanted to save those buildings. But when it came down to, you know, working class people, working class black people living their homes, having their, raising their families, uh, that wasn't valued. That history was not valued. I'll come back to that again over and over again. Value. That, hi that history was not valued by the University of Georgia. That history was not valued by the city of Athens or the federal government. They saw more value there if they could build skyscrapers, student the dormitories, and that's what they did. And I am, it is such a blessing to have somebody like Miss Whitehead stand up and not just say, don't forget, don't forget, this is what happened, but fight and advocate for us to look at the way we preserve history in a completely different way. And we are. The fact that she was able, to, her and the other residents were able to push through a resolution through the, the county commission that we passed unanimously saying not only are we going to recognize the history, but we are going to do things to preserve it and to honor it moving forward and have reparations in place. Um, that is intentional pres preservation of history. And that's the kind of intentional preservation that has to happen on all levels, including the school board. When you leave here today, you're going to go down Prince Avenue, and if you take a look at your right at, at Emanuel Church over here, you're going to see this big white house. And 180 years ago, almost to the day, right, there was a young girl, her name was Aggie Carter. And on that day, she was being auctioned. Now, that's a story we don't tell in our schools. We don't talk about Aggie Carter Mills. We don't talk about how... She is, uh, she is uh, she's bought by the Cobb family, and uh, she becomes a, a confidant of Marianne Cobb, probably one of the most influential women in the United States in the antebellum period. She's going to travel to Washington, D.C. with the family to take care of the children. She's going she's gonna to learn how to read and write because it's going to be important for Marianne to be able to communicate her wishes back to the house. When... The Civil War ends and people are emancipated. She's one of the first people that starts the Knox School. She empowers her children who were born in slavery to go to college. They go to Atlanta University. They become teachers. See, that's a story we don't tell. Because it makes us feel icky. And when I say we, I mean white people. It makes us feel icky. But it's a history that needs to be told. And with historic preservation, you know, we, we preserve the big White House, but what about Aggie's house, which is over here? It's still there, and you can visit it. But our kids don't know that. Heck, if I took a, if I took a poll inside of this room here, the majority of you probably had no idea who even Aggie Carter Mills was. So, you know, her story is what's important to me and the stories of others who built this city, and they did it in bondage. That needs to be told. Thank you. Let's give all our fans
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is part two. We had a great part one. Here's part two. All right, here we go. At this time, the candidates you see before you now are our candidates for the Board of Commissioners for athens Clark County. Okay, we have to my far left here, my far left here, Ms. Asia Thomas, District 3. We have Mr. Jared Bailey, Commissioner Candidate for District 5. Mr. Alan Jones, Commissioner Candidate for District 7. Mr. Dexter Fisher, Candidate for District 5. We've got Ms. Tiffany Taylor, all right, a Candidate for District 3. Mr. Patrick Davenport, Commissioner Patrick Davenport, Incumbent District 1. We've got Matt Pulver, okay, candidate for District 5. And over here, you can, all, you can barely see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to stay out of your way as much as possible. We've got Miss Audrey Hughes, a candidate for District 1. So we've got eight people up here, everyone's vying to represent this great county, Athens, Clark County, is that right? Y'all give them a big hand, okay? <laughs> Good afternoon. We'd like to ask you this afternoon, what is your favorite historic site, building, or neighborhood okay. in Athens? And what is your personal, okay. your personal connection to that All right. particular site? Well, I'm a fan member, fan club member of the Morton Theater, just like everybody else and in the previous panel. And, and I think after... Can you stand, can you stand maybe? Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm used to this all day. So I think probably after listening to everybody, when I was asked that question, there are a lot of beautiful old grand buildings in town, homes and that sort of thing. But the Morton Theater is unique because it's something that Athens saved and it was a community effort. And it was regular people doing their thing in that building. They were going to plays, they were going to hear music, they were going to the doctor, going to the dentist. Um, they were living there. So. That's what makes it unique, and it's so special when you walk in that building, you can still kind of feel that in there. And the fact that the community did rally in the 80s to save that building, and it's now owned by the county, which I think is absolutely fabulous, is, is remarkable. It's an inspiration, um, just the way the community came together to save it. And, and we hear what a difference that makes just by all the people here tonight who are just like, it's awesome. It truly is. Um, a personal connection is I've gone there with my children. We've seen a lot of plays. I've gone there for um, a lot of music events, a lot of, to hear a lot of speakers with my own children. And then I've also drug my own kids and students in there for different things. I've had kids compete in the Ripple Effect Film Festival. And for the last couple of years, this is where we have it. And I think it's absolutely perfect for the students to showcase their films in that building because it's such a part of our history. Um, it's also where I heard a female that inspired me to run for office and I sat through that conversation with my daughter and it was her first election season. So it's got a, it's got a lot of really special memories for me with my own children and, and students that I've worked with over the years and some of the parents I see in the audience. Um, I've been there with your children and it's a remarkable place, and I'm glad we saved it. Great. Now, because we have double the candidates here, we're going to ask them to limit their, their answers to less than 60 to 90 seconds. <laughs> I prefer the 60. I prefer the 60, okay? And then we'll... Uh, Where's the timekeeper? Where's the timekeeper? All right, got it. All right, let's do that. All right, so next... Oh boy, 60 seconds. All right. <laughs> to 90. Let's, I'm, 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 I'm probably going to push this toward 90. All right. Uh, same question, right? Oh, oh Stan, sure. Uh, yeah, so my, uh, it might sound funny, I guess, maybe, but my favorite historical site here in Athens is a parking lot. Um, a parking lot. Um, right now. Um, it's off of Willow Street. Um, sort of a humble, quiet little uh, parking lot. In 1871, it was 243 Bridge Street. Uh, Bridge Street and all the houses there all through Lick Skillet are now lost to history. Uh, white supremacy did what it did. And, um, and, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy that we lost all that. But in 1871, 243 Bridge Street is where Alfred Richardson 
uh, the first black elected uh, politician here in Athens. That's where he had to flee to um, after uh, getting into a uh, one-man war with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, multiple shootouts, and he uh, eventually kills one of them after they had the temerity to, to, to come into his house. Anyway, he has to flee to a black neighborhood. Um, he seeks safety in numbers. And I finally, uh, I've been researching this for years, um, this my sort of personal connection with Alf, uh, Alfred Richardson. Uh, I've spent um, years now writing thousands of words about this hero who should really be uh, recognized in Athens' time end. All right. <laughs> So my um, uh, favorite um, historical spot, it will be Billups Grove Baptist Church. Obviously, that's my home church where I grew up at. Um, we just celebrated our 154th anniversary two weeks ago. Um, so the church is not historic, but the, um, the property and the people are. Um, of course, my people are from Dunlap Road. Um, that's where my family um, have, have come from. And that's uh, my my what my favorite historic spot because of course his family is where, where I get, um, got my history and my roots at um, as well you know especially in the African American community um, preserving our churches is very important because it's it's pretty much our foundation of where we come from and how we keep and preserve our history and I'm glad that um, Michael Thurman wrote a wonderful book um, as a gentleman spoke before that stated um, wrote a book about um, what the was titled a story untold that mentioned Bill Grove Baptist Church and all the other historic churches in Athens. So that would be my favorite spot. Stan. Mm -hmm. My favorite historic building would be Morton Theater. Um, being born and raised in Athens, Georgia, being a third generation, um, my grandma would tell us stories about Morton Theater and how they fought um, to keep Morton Theater. Um, and I was also blessed to be in the Miss Black Athens pageant as a preteen at Morton Theater. So it, it has a lot of significance to me and my family for my grandmother fighting for it and me being able to, um, I guess, go into womanhood. <laughs> um, and so that's why it's precious to me and that's why it's my favorite historic building. Well, I see everybody took most of everybody's um, thing. The Morton is a great place. And the thing about the Morton Theater that um, we happened to talk about was how much commerce went on in um, at the um, Morton Theater at that particular time. Pink Morton started the um, Morton Theater. Somebody had talked about it earlier. And the thing about it was how much commerce was there. We had doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs that was coming out of um, that particular building, and that helped build a hot corner and what we see today that is still preserved in our community. So I do also have one more favorite place. It's Ebenezer Baptist Church West, which is 143 years old. Well, a lot of people don't know, Ebenezer Baptist Church West started on the University of Georgia campus and was moved to West Brog and Billups Street now. So I got two favorite places in this town. That means a lot to me. Hi, Al. Um, I'm going to avoid giving a single place, but um, I would say the, the entire Athens music scene owes itself partially to the locations that they are in. And the, our music scene is in the historic buildings. Our new brewery scene that is developing are in historic buildings. They're revitalizing their buildings. They're using them, and they're, they're part of the experience. They're, they're part of the solidity, the part of the place that makes people want to enjoy that type of a thing in Athens. So that's one favorite. But I live off Timothy Road in District 7, and there is, at the corner of Timothy and Epps Bridge, there's a little white um, schoolhouse, the uh, Chestnut Grove um, Schoolhouse, which was built in the late 1800s. And it was built by the black farmers in the area, which was predominantly what the area was at the time. And it was for black children. And it's just a small building for most people. But those of us that live in that area, and I walk by that every night, it kind of reminds me what our area was. And if you go up to the front of that building, there's a little plaque that uh, lists, I think it's about 54 people that uh, were lynched in Athens between 1870 and 1964. And uh, it's part of our history. It's something we need to remember and something we need not forget. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, it would be very easy to follow the the lead of all these other folks by mentioning the Morton because I've got a very strong connection to it. I own two businesses right by it, the 40 watt and the engine room. And I was in there when REM filmed video there before it was restored, there was still holes in the ceiling. And I was on the board of directors for the Morton Theater for six years. And we used it for AthFest, which is a, an event I created. We used it for years and it, it was a wonderful venue. But since everybody else has talked about the Morton, I'm gonna mention another favorite area of Athens. It's a historic, couple of the historic neighborhoods. And they were in my district when I was a commissioner for eight years. Well, the first couple of years and then they redistricted me. But uh, Cobham and Boulevard historic neighborhoods are, would probably be my answer because everyone's done such a great job of elaborating on the Morton and it is truly a jewel. Thank you. Yeah, so he, he's better than I am going to talk about the Morton Theater. <laughs> um, a part of what I've done with the youth is talk to them about economic development and entrepreneurship. And I think a lot of times, um, even with our work um, with mentoring young men, there's a lot of African-American young men. And a lot of times when you ask them what do they want to be when they grow up, it's I want to be a football player. I want to be a basketball player because that's where they've seen the most success. But when we look at the Morton Theater, we get to see a black man that was able to entrepreneurially build this building, but also um, be able to provide for his family, but also be a place where he was able to empower his community as well. And so um, and so for that, I, I appreciate um, the Morton Theater. I've also had the opportunity of visiting there and going there for plays and, and different things. And so, um, so yeah, the Morton Theater. I believe that local history, a lot of times, if you want to look at an identity or origin of anything, um, you must start at the, the beginning of it, the origin of it, uh, how it started. And I think a lot of things that we're even facing today is rooted in our history. It's rooted in things that have happened before. And I think even as a community, as a society uh, with history, a lot of times it's covered up or it's forgotten or it's overlooked and what we find ourselves doing is repeating history. And I think history is not there for us to go back and relive it, but for us to learn from it, for us to grow from it, for us to, to identify the things that we need to keep in history and also to identify the things that we need to grow from and we need to develop from history. And so I, I think uh, history is something that needs to be told. And even as the first panel talked about earlier, it's not just one side of the history, it's the ugly parts of history. It's the, it's, the, it's the systems and the structures that were set up in history that we are now still today, um, you know, looking at and evaluating things that need to be changed and things that we need to grow from. So when I look at, when I think about local history, I don't think of it um, just in terms of building, but I also, t buildings and, and property, although that is very important, I also think of it in terms of people as well. History is what happens in your community century to century, day to day, and it's very important, and we don't do enough to <coughs> celebrate it here or educate people about it here. Uh, you know, our history here goes back to the Creek Muscogee tribes, the Native Americans, and then of course we had the university founded and there's beautiful buildings and everything else, and it wasn't until the 1960s when people started to realize and point out that historically black neighborhoods like Lindentown was were being destroyed. So there were some efforts and there are continuing efforts to preserve history that, that you didn't hear about every day. And we need to do a better job of educating our community about the, the rich history we have here. One challenge, of course, is we have a, a a group of people, students basically, that come in in droves and then they leave town. It's, it's hard to get them to, uh, to have a grasp of our local history because they're transient. But we need to let people know the amazing history of Athens. I wish I was a history major. <laughs> 
Um, my philosophy of history is, is really that an Athens has some great history and it's got some not so great history. We need to be able to realize both sides of it. We need to not let things like Linentown disappear. We need to learn from our past and we need to make sure that the next generation is aware of those things. We also need to realize that history and our historic structures that we have are a great asset to this city. It's what brings people here. It's what, again, brings a sense of place for people. People don't want to come to a generic looking town. They want to come to a place that resonates, that, that, that feels like it has got some structure and some past in it. So I think we need to, to make sure that we keep our history well known. We need to celebrate it, but as Historic Athens would say, we need to protect it and we need to make sure that uh, our, our structures, not only that are in historic districts, but that are just cool looking old buildings, that um, we still remember them and uh, make sure that we're keeping them going and uh, for the next generation and for our own economic benefit. Of course, my philosophy of history is one of um, culture, one that should be um, sustained. It's one that should everyone should take pride in that particular history or in this particular town. Athens Clark County was um, incorporated in 1806. So from that time to the time now, you know, a lot of that history was mainly white history. Our story wasn't told at all. It's beginning to get told, and I'm glad that historic um, Athens is beginning to tell that. In years past, um, when historic Athens was um, founded some years ago, our history was not included in that. That was unfortunate. Moving forward, though, with the new administration and what they're trying to do here now is to bring our history to life. I think that's really important. And for me, we got to make sure that we sustain our history, along with other history, too. But we need to make sure our, so our children know what our history is about, um, moving forward, what Athens is about, how we were founded, and also what the African-American community has provided over the course of a number of years. So that's sort of my philosophy about history in athens Clark County. My philosophy on local history is that you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And it's very important that we preserve our history for the generations that's after us, not pick and, and choose um, what history is preserved, but all of the history of Athens. And because it shapes us into the people that we are, it's shaped um, the generation before us, and it'll shape the generation after us. So to preserve all of our history, not just certain um, history. So when I first started college, my first major, I went through several, unfortunately, um, <laughs> was a history major. I wanted to study Georgia history, but um, when you, when I got to the 1800, got very depressing, so I changed my, um, changed my major. But anyway, the best, my philosophy on, um, on uh, philosophy on history, on local history, um, the best way to, you can't preserve history if you don't know it. So we got to teach it, and we have to preserve it, um, because history is pretty much our foundation of where we, where we have been and where we're going. And we need to educate everyone, and especially the people, because we are a transit community, of how far we've come. The African-American history in Athens is very phenomenal. A lot of people in this room probably don't know how phenomenal the history of the African-American people and culture, even with the indigenous people. My great, great, three, four great grandmother and grandfather were Creek Indians, and they married into the African-American um, community, and it just people don't know that. But if you don't know your past, it's hard for you to dictate your future. So preserving local history, especially just telling a more broad, diverse story of our local history is, is very important. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to sort of piggyback off of what uh, Tiffany and, and uh, Commissioner Davenport said. Yeah, I mean, we don't know where we're going if we don't uh, know our past. Um, history isn't something that you put behind museum glass and it's like that's what happened back then. Like history is still happening. History never stopped. Um, so, you know, if you don't know your past, if, if, if you don't know, for instance, that north of downtown, north of Doherty, 
uh, out toward the river were two uh, historically black, thriving black communities, uh, the Bottoms and, and Lick Skillet. Um, if you don't know that, then when development is going to come, and trust me, it's going to come there, um, you won't know that it's being built on the graves of two neighborhoods that were like raised, that were just entirely uh, bulldozed by white supremacy and urban renewal. So you're not thinking about how do we make that part of town inclusive. Um, it can't look like the rest of everything that's happened around downtown, right? Um, I mean, there's enough of that. Um, we have to be maximally inclusive in that part of downtown. Um, the future of that part of downtown has to reflect its past. Um, and if you don't know that history, um, then you're doomed to, to repeat the same mistakes of the past. Okay, let me get situated with all these water bottles and stuff down here. All right, so um, I think local history is important. I think um, when I moved to a new place and I have had the privilege of living in some historic communities over the years. I lived in Savannah for a while, um, which is the first city in Georgia. Jonesboro, Tennessee, first town in East Tennessee, has totally unique character. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which has um, a unique flair with the Moravian culture there. So I think local history needs to include everybody. Um, I know we often forget, and I, th I think the world is changing, and that's a good thing. Um, we're hearing more about women. We're hearing more about Native Americans. We're hearing more about the role of um, African Americans. We're hearing more about the role of um, new immigrants that were of all sorts of things, not just white immigrants. So I, I think that's important. And um, so my view is that everybody who's been in a place has left a mark. And we need to know what those marks are, no matter who they were. And I know I'm probably getting the next question, so I could roll into some examples, but um, I'll, I'll stick with the seconds that I'm given. What, 90 seconds? All right, so there is. Mm -hmm. Okay. What role should preservation play in the future of Athens, Clark County? Okay, I think we have a goal mine here that we're not utilizing. And just from living in some of these other communities, like Jonesboro is, if you're not familiar with East Tennessee, it is a small mountain town, but they have the world's best storytelling festival. And that brings in thousands of people multiple times a year. And they've also, so that brings in lots of tourism and lots of dollars, and we need that in Athens. And that's part of my platform is we need to get some more money in Athens because our number one problem when I surveyed people before running, it's poverty. Our kids need help. Our older people need help. Our regular people need help. So bottom line, we've got to get some dollars into this town. We've got some things we could do, like Jonesboro, Tennessee had the Storytelling Festival. They also had a really neat place with old school, and I took notes about Chestnut Grove. They have an old school set up, and you can bring kids on field trips there from all over East Tennessee. And what they do is they role play what life would have been like if they were students back in that day and era. So they, they spend a day there. They have to, they can't have their phones. They have to, oh, which is like torture for some of them. Um, and they, they actually have to live and go to school as if they were around back then. And if the field trip is in the wintertime, guess what? They have to go get wood. They have to keep things going. They have to go to the well and get water. So it's, it's well, we are talking about modern children. And so <laughs> they do send them to the library next door. So they didn't want to go that route. But. They, they sit at the little tables and they use the ink wells and the, the old fashioned blackboards and it, it's really a neat experience. So that's, that's something that we could do. Um, storytelling festival. Um, oh, my time is up, but I could go on and on about this. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, yeah, like, like Audrey was saying, I, I think, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of historic um, assets in this town. Um, and they can certainly be leveraged for you know, tourism and, and, and whatever sort of economic benefit we can derive from them. Um, I think uh, history can be enjoyed uh, and studied and preserved for its own sake. Um, but I'll go back to what I said before. It is also um, it should be a guide for us. Um, it's not something that, um, his, you know, history never stopped. History was yesterday and the, and the yesterday before that. And it is a way that we understand our present and um, understand um, a, a just and equitable future. Um, 
so while you know history is is um is, is valuable in its in its own right, I mean I enjoy old buildings as much as as much as the next person. Um, it's not simply that. Um, it is um, it should serve as a guide uh, for us going forward. Yes. All righty. Just keep in mind, everybody. Georgia is one of the one of the first thirteen colonies, and Athens is is in course in Georgia. So the history in Athens is very long and pronounced, and the, the history just not only black, and indigenous, white, it's a very vast history, um, and I think the government is doing a good job in trying to preserve some of that history, and with our partnership with um, Historic Athens and with some of our community groups, um, history is very important, like, like some of my colleagues, and colleagues, sorry, I'm not on Mayor Commission right now, um, some of my um, mates up here um, have stated we, we gotta preserve that history because if that history is lost, we're not gonna know, um, we're going to lose uh, a sentiment of who we are as individuals and how far we have come. But the government should always play a role in preserving its own history because, you know, for the future generations to understand how far we've come and where we are heading towards the future. Historic preservation is very important. Um, because without the preservance of history, then how will the children after us know how far we've come? So it's very important to me. Okay. So I, I guess one of the things that I want to talk about is that historic preservation is essential to the charm and also the history of our city. You know, we need to make sure that when we're looking at historic preservation that all of the structures that we have, especially the architectural structures that we have here, that we want to maintain those structures in some form or fashion. We need to make sure that if we're going to um, look at maintaining that building, how are we going to maintain that building? And what does it going to mean for us going forward? So I think the charm and the beauty of the architectural structures that we do here in this community, I spent most of my career at UGA working with architects and trying to preserve those buildings on campus. So, so for me, I think the charm the um, preservation of those particular buildings, how we maintain those buildings so we can preserve for the future of our children and for the future of this community. Thank you. Um, I'm a big fan of the rescue, reinvest, and revitalize concept of uh, historic preservation. I think we need to do that. We need to not feel that uh, history is, our buildings have to be locked in time, but continue to develop that uh, for the best of the, the future generations. But it's not just about protecting the pretty things. It's, there's a lot of cottage neighborhoods in Athens, and I, some of them are in places like Five Points, but others are in areas like East Athens, which right now is a powder keg for gentrification. Being able to protect those neighborhoods and those small cottages, whether it be through historic preservation, zoning, or what have you, and we've all seen it, and the, the people that they buy up a piece of land and they either build a two or three, they take down the nice cottage, put a two or three story building on top of it, or they buy two pieces of land and uh, slam them together so they can put a McMansion in what used to be a historic neighborhood. That drives up the the prices, which which may be okay in Five Points, but for somewhere like East Athens, people that want to stay there, people that have been there for generations, uh, it makes it very difficult. Historic pres preservation is a really important tool in placemaking, and placemaking is something that creates, helps create a community where people want to live, work, and visit. Which, that's really economic development right there. You want these people to stay that are, that have skills, uh, and you want companies to move here, you want people to come here and visit, and we get a lot of benefit from tourism already. Uh, so we should think of it as an economic development tool, and I happen to be a trained, formally trained in economic development and worked for the Economic Development Foundation for years. So besides the aesthetic quality that we see and enjoy, we should think of it in the broader sense, too, that we're creating this place that other people are going to be attracted to 
and it'll just benefit us all. It makes a better community a better place. Awesome. So I, you know, when we talk about historic preservation, you know, I, even going back to the buildings, um, I think that even as our community, there is no buildings without the people. And so I, I, even going back to preserving, you know, even the neighborhoods, as, as he mentioned, I think it's so important. But I also would like to see how we can take some of these buildings and address some of the problems that we are facing today, like affordable housing. Um, they are or, or dealing with this mental illness issue. You know, over there at North School, where the encampment is located at now, there's a North School there that was one of the schools that um, was segregated, where only blacks, the only black school there. How can we take that building and preserve it, but also use it to solve some of our problems, to, you know, make it a affordable housing building that, that could possibly be a place of housing for the, the those that are experiencing homelessness, or be a place of housing for those who are dealing with issues of mental illness. So how can we preserve these, but also use them as solutions to the current problems that we are facing. And so I definitely think that um, that that is a role that historic preservation plays can play in the future. And I know I have that next question. <laughs> Right. So um, as a commissioner, I believe that my job is to be uh, a ear, to hear what the community um, needs are and to be an advocate for the community. So I think when we're looking at changing policy, I think in order to be a voice, you have to first be a ear. And so I think that involves getting the community involved in some of the, in, in the policy, being able to, you know, that education piece, even as the panel talked about before, a lot of times people don't know, um, they're, they're, they don't know that. So making sure that they understand and they're getting the information. You know, I talk about some of the things that are happening, even that go forth, um, during the commission meetings, and a lot of people are like, "Well, we don't, we don't, we didn't know about it. You know, we didn't know that this happened. We didn't know that these decisions were being made." And so, how do we make sure the community is getting this type of information? I believe that my job is to be a bridge and also be an advocate and be a voice to hear what the concerns of the community are and and what what issues they're facing in order to make these policies that are going to benefit the community as a whole. Thank you. Uh, as a former county commissioner, I've seen struggles firsthand for neighborhoods trying to get historic designation. And it's very divisive. And part of it is that homeowners don't always understand the benefits of all they see are the costs. They don't see the benefits. So I think one of the things we need to do as a community, and historic Athens could do a little better too, is to educate homeowners, landowners, property owners about the benefits of historic preservation. Like I said before, we, we make the town a, a more pleasant place if we can preserve its history, where we can better educate our children about the history too, if the buildings are still here, and can create tourism and just a, a really strong community. So we just need to educate folks better uh, when neighborhoods are trying to go through this process, it's it's can be very it, it's can be a very heated thing that that people picking sides and never talking to each other again because they d disagreed on the attempt to get a historic designation. Um, I'm also going to say, you know, as a commissioner, my goal is to be listening to the people, not only in my district, but throughout the city. So as far as having all the solutions to the historic designation problems, I'm, I don't have those. But we have great organizations like Historic Athens that should be the people that we are working with on a regular basis for things like this. And it should be not just that, but uh, other community leader groups. It should be businesses. It should be um, groups of people that are the urbanists, the uh, racial justice advocates, a number of people that should be working together on these things as, as we forge these relationships. Um, I would say that it would be great to have a little bit stronger just urban design guidelines to answer the 
question a little bit more specific, because as we're about to redevelop Bethel Homes, for instance, and the mall and other areas, I'm, we can do what's been done around the downtown area where we've got these, you've got retail on the bottom and you've got stucco a few levels up. Um, or we can say we want Athens to remain having a sense of unity, a sense of place, and uh, we want to put some guidelines to say here's some good ideas, not, re not regulations, but here, here's some things that we as a city think would work. So I have to sort of agree with what Mr. Jones has just stated. Um, I think, you know, we have a rich history in this community. And I think it's important, though, as a commissioner, though, each community is different. So I think we need to poll those communities and see whether or not do they want um, historical preservation in their particular room. I don't think it should be forced on them. I think we as a commissioner should listen to the people that we represent. And if they, if we make the suggestion or they make the suggestion that they want to have historic preservation in the community, then we should move forward to that. But we need to have the proper policies in place and we need to make sure that if we're looking at historical preservation for that particular um, neighborhood, then we need to make sure the people that live there want that to happen. It should not be forced on them. So I believe that the community should have that responsibility if they want to have historic destination. I believe that it is up to the community um, how it will benefit them um, and their surroundings as far as um, historic preservation. I, while I do think it is significant, I also think community is significant as well and the residents, how it will benefit them um, and how it, cre how it can create um, a sense of belonging um, to everyone that's um, in the community. So inclusiveness and, um, yeah. I gotta lose some weight, sorry about that. Um, first we need um, a kind of wide assessment of what's historic and of our historic property, not only just in buildings, but on roads, streets, um, cemeteries, buildings, neighborhoods. Um, do a kind of wide assessment to see what's historic. Secondly, I think we, it's very important to educate the public and those who live in those surrounding areas of the important significant, historic significance of those streets, cemeteries, um, public buildings, and then start working with our community partners like Historic Athens to preserve those neighborhoods, preserve those those um, structures and those facilities because it's important for us to, to keep our history um, and to understand our past, um, and I believe just with the work that the county has already done with, um, with um, we put some money into funding a study. I think we just need to proceed with that. And, but my main concern would be to, to do an assessment countywide of our historic places and educating the pe people on it. And then continuing with that process by getting those, um, those sites historically designated. Uh, yeah. Um what I have is, is, is maybe not exactly policy, um, but I would urge us to focus on um, more recent historical structures. You know, um, I think it's easy to, to look at the big pink thing over here and say, well, that's historic, right? Um, but that house, um, were it to be owned by someone who wasn't some big fancy Confederate guy, uh, might have been torn down before it had a chance to even be historic, right? Uh, the National Register, of, uh, Na National Register of Historic Places and other preservationists have what they call the 50-year rule. Um, if, any, if something is uh, 50 years old and has cultural significance, it is uh, technically historic. Um, so in that context, I think of uh, like the Frank C. Maddox uh, Center on Magnolia, right? Um, should be um, preserved, uh, but it hasn't... Um, but it hasn't been. I mean, this is a this was a place where James Brown, BB King, performed. This was a a concert hall, a, a meeting place. Um, it was it was a Greater Bethel AME had had church services there for a while when their church burned. It was a daycare center. Uh, also, James Brown played there, y'all. <laughs> I mean, so like if 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 there was a time end, all right. All right first thing I would do is listen to the constituents. You know, this is their community. What do they want? And, and that's something I do go around and ask people a lot now is, what do you want? 
tell me what you want and, and let's see what's really going on. And I've done so much homework lately, it's uh, mind boggling. But anyway, this is fascinating town to learn way more about in a different way. So I, I talk to people first and find out what they want. And um, because I'm a science teacher, I would say we need to have some sort of measured way to do that on top of that. Let's, let's track it, let's have a record, let's just don't willy-nilly do this, let's, let's find out for sure. And then let's, once we find out what people want, let's work with experts. And we have a wealth of resources here in this town affiliated with the university. The gentleman running for school board that's a historian, I would love to sit down and just talk with him one day. Is that for me? No. Okay. So I would work to make sure once we had all those things in place, that places that people wanted protected were protected. And I'm not just talking about buildings. We have the potential for little villages, like Whitehall Village is absolutely amazing. And it was a mill. Um, we had a debate today at school about uh, the Barnett Shoals Power Plant, but it's right across the line in Oconee, so it's technically not Clark, but it's pretty cool. It's got a neat history, and maybe we could team up with Oconee for something there. I don't know. Thanks. Okay. Now, <laughs> but I get the next one. <laughs> stand, we're going to shift gears a little Okay. Time. I know all of you all would do a countywide assessment. I know that. We all know that. So I'm not even going to ask that question. But I am going to ask you, there's been a great deal of discussion about the impact of short-term and long-term rentals in our historic neighborhoods. I'm going to talk about short-term and long-term rentals <laughs> in our historic neighborhoods. If elected, ma'am, mm -hmm. if elected, what approach would you take to navigate this issue? Well, that's an issue in neighborhoods that are not historic, mm -hmm. mine in particular. Um, so what, what I would do is I think... And the perception that I've gotten from many is that they feel like these investors, and some of them are investors that don't live here, are driving the price of properties up for everyone, whether you're historic or not. Um, and I know this is tough because I know in our neighborhood we have covenants, and our covenants were written 25 years ago before Airbnb and VRBO and any of those things were even around, so that's something I'm on the HOA board for my neighborhood, and that's something we are in the process of trying to do is get started on some covenant revisions to address these issues that are now, like, before us and, and we have to address. So I, I think what our mayor and commission could do is they could set up some ordinances restricting short-term rentals. They could set some parameters for long-term rentals, and that's an issue in our neighborhood. People that sell their home or, or they're, they're moving, they have to move for a job, and they, they need the flexibility to be able to rent their house until they can sell it. I mean, right now, people are selling homes before they even hit the market, but that's not going to continue. Reality is going to hit at some point. So, thanks. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I think uh, if by short-term rentals we mean uh, college student rentals, um, uh, yeah, that could certainly negatively affect uh, you know historic properties. I mean, I wouldn't want a 19-year-old college kid near anything historic. I wouldn't want a 19-year-old college kid near something brand new. Um, so yeah, we don't. We, I mean, you know, so uh, you know, like Audrey said, I mean, I think um, some sort of ordinance might might be considered. Um, you know, limiting at least short-term. Um, or, or, you know, I don't know how we would exactly design that, but um, uh, they break everything. So um, keep them away from the nice stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is Devin. Okay. So, and uh, currently the government has two policy making committees the GOC, as the Government Operations Committee, as well as the uh, LRC, Legislative Review Committee. GOC last year, the Government Operations Committee, um, was it last year? COVID. Two years ago. Um, we review short-term rentals. One of the um, one of the hindrances is um, we are uh, a state. The state pretty much controls local control of what we can do. Um, but I am when I first came on, one of my biggest one the one of the first projects that I worked on was the the party house. I don't know if y'all remember the party house or heard of the party house, um, but it was in a nice neighborhood where this gentleman who lived in Colorado, Colorado. Um, he rented out his house to parties and mostly on game days, had a nice pool, blah, blah, blah. And um, I remember me and Commissioner, um, late Commissioner Neesmith worked on the policies to regulating um, the noise and street parking and stuff like that. But um, um, we are 
currently still working with the state and working locally to fix short-term and long-term rental. Um, um, long-term and short-term um, rentals, um, I didn't really think much about the historic districts. I thought about Athens as a whole, and I thought about the effects that it has on communities and homes. A lot of us have children, and these short rentals, um, they aren't um, the best solution um, to our neighborhoods. Um, it, it's a distraction more than anything. Um, I know from my neighborhood, it causes more policing in my neighborhood than usual because we do have these short-term short um, rentals. So I would think that there should be ordinances put into place where um, the short term should have to act the same way that the residents do. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So I think all of us agree up here that we need some type of ordinance in place in order for us to um, deal with short term and long term rentals. Um, I think the problem is though we have started something and we can't get hold of it. So now it's going to be up to the mayor and commissioners to get either working with our state, um, local election of, uh, elected officials, or with someone who can help us with long-term and short-term um, rentals. We have um, at, at um, CCSD right now, Clark County School District, we got two, um, prop two houses on our property right now. We got to figure out what we're going to do. Are we going to sell those two properties, or are we going to rent those properties out? Um, and I'm not going to tell you what we're thinking about doing, but at the same time, it could cause a problem if we, if we send it to the wrong type of people and they end up renting at the college student and you sit there, that's where the board office is, then you got parties going on. So that can be a problem. So we got to come up with some type of ordinance within our local government in order to make these things go away, short-term and long-term rentals. Thank you. There, as Patrick said, there's, there's only so much we can do at a local level. A lot of this is determined for us by the state, and there are things that there's the noise ordinance, there, there's parking restrictions, there's some of those pieces that can be done. Um, it would be great for us to do more. I was out knocking doors this past weekend. I went to a, a house that they said, well, the people that own the house next door, they, they live in Japan and they rent it out, and they're talking about how the yard has been ruined and, and all of these things. And yeah, it would be great to be able to say, uh, no, 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 you can't do that anymore. But um, we, we have to obey the, the state pieces where we have to. One thing we can look at is we have an ordinance in place that says if, if more than two unrelated people live in the same house, then they can't do it. And I disagree with that. I think if more than two people live in the same house and they're not related, there needs to be some constraints on that. But if the owner lives there, chances are they're not going to be violating the noise ordinance. We need affordable housing, and there's almost nothing more affordable than somebody renting out a bedroom to, to somebody in need. So on that case, I think we need to make changes to that policy. Thanks. Uh, I think as a former commissioner, I know that there's certain things that you can and cannot legislate on people. It's very difficult to legislate people, telling people where they can live and where they can't and how many people can rent. We did have the, uh, just before I came on the commission, there was a, a big squabble over it, it passed, about this unrelated uh, number of occupants, unrelated occupants in one house. It was passed, but it was kind of a failure because we really didn't enforce it. And you've got to be careful about passing rules that you can't enforce very well. And you've, you've got to let people live where they want to live, and, and so it, you just got to be careful about it. So it's a very difficult question. Instead of trying to answer it, I'm going to try and give you a, a little... Uh, a, a success story, okay? <laughs> well, okay. Commissioners have to vote on demolition of any house in Athens-Clark County that's older than 50 years old, okay? 
It's not, it doesn't have to be 100, anything over 50. So on Sunset Area, there were a lot of small houses, there were rentals, and they went through a phase where there were families buying them. And they would, I would have to actually make the decision and then make a recommendation to the commission that you know, this not be torn down, but they want to do this. They want to expand it and keep it in the character of the house, but expand it so a family could live there instead of it just being a rental. Uh, so it's kind of a success story in that one area of by working with these people that want, yeah, sorry. Anyway, there are ways to do it, it's difficult. Awesome, there, there I go, being the last one again. Um, so I think that when we're, we're looking at it, um, a part of we have to look at the laws and how people are able to govern their property. Um, you know, when I thought about it, I automatically thought about Airbnbs and, you know, that's the big thing. And as an entrepreneur, I, I hope to own some Airbnbs at some point. And so I think ordinances of how this is going to disturb the neighbors and the neighborhoods and um, the people that are living in these areas, I think that that needs to be evaluated. But I also would like to see a historic site kind of like set up like Stone Mountain where, you know, people can come come and bring their families, but they can stay in hotel rooms. They, they, there's a place that they can come, and it kind of tells the story of Athens in this particular horse, uh, um, historic site. So I think going back to historic preservation, I would like to see how we can take some of these buildings and bring more um, economy in, but also be able to solve some of these problems in a way that maybe if they're short-term stays, that they're in a particular area, right? They're, they're Airbnbs or there's a hotel that kind of we've preserved and we allow people to stay there and it's bringing money into the city. So um, those are my thoughts concerning that. Right. How would you address it? So I want to just read the definition uh, really quickly. Well, in, I, I, okay. Okay. Okay, so I think that when we dealing with demolition neglect, I believe that it talks about how they um, the properties they allow them to get to a point where they're so old that you can't preserve them, right? And so with that, we need to be evaluating what's in our area. I believe that there may be some code enforcement that when we see buildings getting to a place where they're unrepairable, that someone is saying, "Hey, look, we need to check this out and be able to contact even the connection between the organizations, Historic Athens, to be able to see." Is this something that we need to tear down or is this something that we can save and preserve? I don't think that we need to wait till it gets to the point where it has to be demolished to begin to talk about what we should do about it. When I came on the commission, it was just a couple of years after the 2008 real estate downturn, bust, whatever you want to call it. And we were starting to see more and more vacant houses because there were a lot of foreclosures and it, it was becoming a real problem. So at that time, the county commission did adjust their ordinances and put aside some monies to demolish some of these, these properties because there were safety hazards and health hazards because they were becoming places where people went to do drugs and whatever. So we do have some policies in effect, but we probably need to, re, to look at them again, revisit them. Um, if we're talking about demolition by neglect, I think the big thing is that, you know, there's a number of developers who buy properties and then they let them go into neglect. Historic properties, his, properties with story, they let them go into neglect so that they can say, no, it's no longer economically feasible for, for me to do this. I need to be able to tear it down and build whatever I can make the most money I possibly can for. Um, I'll just say, as a, as a candidate, I am not going to be taking any money knowingly from any developers just so I don't have to um, be beholden to anybody on those types of issues. So I think what we need to do is take it by a case-by-case case issue in each um, particular area based on, on where that demolition may take place. Um, I think, again, if it's in a community of a normal people and it's becoming a blight on that particular community, then maybe that may be the time to go ahead and um, demolish that particular property. But I think you look at it by a case-by-case -case basis based on the ordinance and policy that we already have in place with the, um, with the Clark County government. And then if that's the case, then we should go ahead and demolish 
or we can preserve it, then we try to preserve it. But I think it should be a case by case, and I would study that on case by case basis. Um, piggybacking off of what Mr. Fisher said, um, I think demolition by neglect. Um, we first should learn the history of um, the building, why it was neglected, um, what's the plan for if it is the limit, um, if it is demolished, what will um, this area be next, as well as how does this affect the community around it? Um, Will it help the community? Will it benefit from it? Or will it take from it? So there's a lot of different aspects. But I believe what Mr. Fisher, Mr. Fisher said, we do have to take it case by case. I don't believe in demolition by neglect. I'm a big person in recycling. Every piece of wood now can be reused and be repurposed to, to build something new. Um, I believe that we, we, that's something that we should do with all of our structures. Bill of Grove Schoolhouse is one of those buildings that's literally deteriorating as we speak right now, but the church is dedicated in trying to preserve it and reusing that wood to re, um, repurpose that, that building. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, when we talk about demolition by neglect, I think we're probably really talking about wealth and income inequality, wealth inequality. Um, I mean, I don't see any um, beautiful homes on, on Boulevard or around there being being uh, neglected. Um, this Cobb house, again, I hate to rag on the, the pink thing, but um, but it was treated better than some literal citizens of Athens. Do you all remember when it came in? They like wheeled it in. It was like a whole big, uh, um, no neglect over there. Um, so, you know, I. Um, I, I, I just, uh, oh, time in. Okay. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good, y'all. All right. I totally agree with Mr. Fisher. It, it does need to be on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, if, if you've got a homeowner, let's say they've been, one example I can think of that's, that was in the media a while back was a homeowner was sick with cancer and he wasn't able to upkeep his property and you know, basically just talk to the homeowners and find out what's going on, what help do they need, and then try to help them with some resources. But if it's a developer that's just letting it go f into disrepair, I mean, the city could slap some fines on them left and right every time. So I think that's something that could be done. Real quick, mm -hmm. just tell me one fact or figure, one, that inspires you. Okay, so I had the privilege yes, and honor of uh, get to know a lot about Jessie Walton Barnett and work with her great granddaughter. And she was an advocate here in the community and her granddaughter is carrying on that tradition and um, really pleased to know both those folks and play a role in helping Athens Clark County get clean water and sewer for everybody in the community. Amen. Still fighting that battle. Uh, so what is a uh, historical Factor, figure. Um, yeah, I think um, I'll return to Alfred Richardson, um, who by 1868, um, three years into his freedom, he had accumulated nine acres of land out in Watkinsville with a nice house, and um, I, I marvel at that. I mean, how in three years um, he was able to build that, and that's incredible. Not maybe not a historical figure for some of you. Well, most of you people in this room, but Doc Connie Davenport, my father. Um, a lot of people in East Athens, especially African American, knew him. He was a car mechanic. He always invited people into his home. Is where I, I got my instilled my discipline. And he was a nice person. Fortunately, he passed away. May he rest in peace. What inspires me is the people of Athens, the residents of Athens, because no matter how much um, ordinance and things are put into place to block us, our resilience. It lasts generations to generations, so it would be us as residents. So the one person that I would, um, from a historical figure, would be Adam A. Harum, who was the first African American dentist to practice in the um, Athens Clark County um, in this community. So I think um, that says a lot about her and her will to, you know, be able to practice, especially as a woman and as an African American woman. Yeah, I had a much longer answer that would take a lot of details to explain, so I'm going to make it simple and say uh, Leroy Lucian Jones. Um, my grandfather, he was a poultry professor at UGA. Um, he eventually opened up Jones Hatchery and uh, kept that going until the 60s, and my, my family was involved with that organization. Um, the building still stands, which was historic even back then, and um, I'm glad it's there because I can look back and see part of my family. 
As a longtime proponent for arts and music in this community, I'm very inspired about how we were able to preserve historic preservation, the Linden House, the original building, and then the addition to it and use it as a community resource. And that was, that was spearheaded by two people, Ronnie Lukashevitz and his wife, and, and Nancy, Nancy Lukashevitz. I was dropping the plane, but they've both passed on, Nancy just recently, but it was their will that created this amazing resource that still has a lot of historic preservation aspects in it. Um, I would say Hattie Whitehead and um, the story of uh, Lennontown and just her courage to be able to tell that story about how, you know, um, her father took all the money they had to buy a house and then had to be displaced um, due to eminent domain and, and just the courage um, for her to come forth with that and to, you know, seek, seek a recompense. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you, Hope. Appreciate it very much. Once again, we want to just say thank you all so much uh, for joining us tonight, uh, being with us here tonight. I call this the heavyweight, okay? That's all right. In this corner over here, we got Pearl Hall, all right, next to Mr. Dr. Fred Mormon right here. He's next door, and him's going to be Mr. Benny Coleman. That's right. And of course, over here on my far right over here, we got Miss Makisha Ross. But last but certainly not least, wearing the belt right now, they call him the Ric Flair of Athens, Georgia. Give it up for Mayor Kelly Gertz. <laughs> All right, we're going to have fun this time, okay? We're going to have some fun here this evening. Uh, I just like to have humor, and you kind of loosen the crowd up a little bit. How about that? You loosen you guys up. So what better way than rumble roll, okay? Is that right? <laughs> Only one distinction here tonight. We're going to talk about historic preservation, all right? Can we do that? So all our questions, once again, for our candidates tonight are geared towards centered around for our purpose here this evening, Rosemary, and that, of course, being... Historic preservation. Having had the opportunity to serve on Historic Athens, back then Athens Clark Heritage Foundation, uh, for a number of years, I feel like I grew bald sitting on that board, okay? <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, I, I am very passionate about historic preservation. Uh, very passionate about what it means to Athens Clark County, what it means for surrounding towns, having the opportunity to visit Charleston, visit Savannah, visit other cities and see what they have. And I say, you know what? Yeah, they got those big buildings and those old buildings, but you know, this is Athens Clark County in Northeast Georgia, y'all, okay? And we should be doggone proud of what we got to offer here, okay? And that's why I work very hard in getting people to come to Athens, you know, in this area, okay? So tonight, this last race means so much to you all as citizens. It means an awful lot because the mayor is the CEO of this operation, okay? Some people say, so goes the temperament of the mayor, so goes the temperament of the community, okay? And I, had, I was in uh, Augusta, Georgia last week for a little thing down there where people were teeing this little ball down there. And I had an opportunity to spend some time with the mayor of Augusta, Georgia. And he talked about Athens, Georgia. When I was from Athens and in the area here in Oconee and Athens, and he, he talked about Athens, Georgia. And he can't wait to get back to Athens, Clark County. So when you get other mayors talking about visiting your town and you know the the rich history that you all that we have here that's a testament so tonight it's time to what let's get ready to rumble all right thank you thank you what is your favorite historic building or neighborhood in athens and what is your personal Connection to it, ma'am. Um, my favorite building and connection would be the East Athens Development Center, the Marion Moore Center. And the reason I have that connection with that is because she's a champion to our community, but the heritage, the culture that she brought, 
Um, and I'm very well connected with outreach and community that she done. So I think to still have that, even though we, we redistrict, but um, to have that is very important for our next generation to inherit. So I would say Mary and Moore Center is very much so my answer. So uh, the, the place that I think about when I think about the historic nature of Athens is the seaboard rail line station on College Avenue. Um, it's the one you may know as the spot where uh, about half the college kids who've come to this town jam their U-Haul right, right underneath the trestle. But more importantly, it's a place where if you're standing, you're really at the epicenter of so many of the layers of history and culture in Athens. Um, you can stand there and see things that have been preserved. Uh, you can see the roof line of the Linden House. You can see the historic cottonseed oil mill that sits on Pulaski Street across the valley. Um, but sadly, you can be in that same spot, and there are a lot of missing pieces. The Lick Skillet and the Bottoms neighborhoods that were almost completely decimated in urban rule were around that rail line. Yes, also have the social history of Athens. Um, you have people who, as part of the Great Migration, moved from Athens to parts north, to New York City, to Chicago. You, know, you have the economic history of Athens from that point. You know, all through the 1800s, the cotton culture. So there's so much from that one vantage point that you can see that really embodies the good, the bad, and the ugly, sadly, of Athens history. And um, it, it is something that I can see from my bathroom window uh, as, as I gaze out there. And so when I moved on to Pulaski Street in the 1990s, um, it, it was important to me to know what was around me, both present and past. Mine would be East Athens School. And what I remember so greatly about that school were kids, especially our black kids, where they loved one another. They went to school with obedience. They cared about one another. They had respect for one another. But sadly to say, integration of that school back then and what's, what's going on today in school today, we are segregating our own self, black against black. And the joy of going to East Athens School compared to the joy of going to a school today is no comparison. Well, we allow our kids to do whatever and whenever they want to do. Well, we as parents do not want to do our jobs. So the, the joy I have is the remember of that school building is when I went to school there. Little girl respected himself and boys respected girls. But today, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any joy for anything else right now. Mr. Marvin. Thank you, Mr. Marvin. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody has any wonder uh, as to which building I like best in Athens. Uh, <laughs> um, that would be the Fred building. <laughs> um, I'm uh, kind of partial to that name, although as a young child, I, I didn't like being called Fred. There was Fred Flintstone and uh, a few other cartoonish characters that uh, made me not like Fred, but uh, as I got older, I embellished that name, and I uh, tried to make more of it than, than what it really was, a four-letter word <laughs> that starts with an F. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I have been here in Athens um, I received my third uh, college diploma here in food science department at the University of Georgia. And uh, I fell in love with Athens at that time. And uh, then I became a dermatologist and spent uh, 28 years here seeing uh, dermatology patients or people, normal patients with a skin problem. <laughs> but uh, Athens is such a historic city. I've uh, Reading, I've been reading more on it lately, and uh, at one time, uh, well, I did hear today that it was, uh, the University of Georgia has been here longer than the city has been named Athens. So let's, let's uh, never forget what brought Athens here, and it was the University of Georgia. I've heard very little about the University of Georgia during this uh, uh, conference and discussion, but uh, how about them damn dogs? 
uh, we really won the national championship this year. And I was here uh, in 1980 and 82 when Herschel Walker put us on the map then. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. First, I'd like to say good afternoon to each and every one of you, and thank you for coming out today. And the question is, what is my favorite historical site? Let me tell you, my grandmother, my grandparents bought a house on Hancock and Rock Spring, and it still stands today. So I can tell you the history of Athens, Clark County. You talked about the Morton building. We was in and out Miss Morton house, and her mother was our dentist, Dr. Green, where the brothers of Donna Rail and Fred Rail father in their office today was our doctor. We had the shoe shine, Sheets Barber Shop. We had Wilson, Wilson Soul Food. We did not have to leave that community for anything. Everything we needed from Plaza Street, the educators, Hope Grandmother, one of our principals at our school. So if you want to know the history of the historic area, uh, Hancock and Rock Spring, see me. West Broad Elementary School, that was our school. And I pray that it will stand forever. And then, not only that, we had all kinds of people in our neighborhood. So, that is my spot. Hancock, Rock Spring, and my grandmother's house still stands today and family member still lives in that house. Those are my favorite spot, and I know as I listen to some of you all talk about this person and that person, let me tell you about that person. I visit their homes. I walk through their homes. We lived in those areas. So those are my favorite spot, the Hancock and Rock Spring area, Thank as dear to me. What is your philosophy? My philosophy on local history is to keep the West Broad and Bernie Harris High School the only school that we have standing as Afro-Americans. We've had, we watched many schools in Athens, but West Broad and Bernie Harris is all we have. Let's keep it there. Yes, um, thank you. Um, the question, what is my philosophy on local history? <clears throat> well, I think uh, you are what you eat, and you are where you came from. And uh, if you come from Athens, um, you will have um, the sense of having been here. I, I've always described Athens, Georgia, as uh, somewhat of a European city. Uh, in my travels, I have been to 38 countries. Some of those were just changing the plane in the airport, like in Tokyo. But uh, it's a great uh, part of my life to uh, go back or look at another country. It's like they're filming a movie just for me. Uh, but I don't really believe that. I have the, uh, the ticket to go backstage and watch everything in that country that I want to see some things I want to do, and I think things that are done in Athens are things that I do not want to be in Athens. Uh, I can get more specifically on those things in uh, perhaps a private conference. <laughs> some may not want to hear uh, what I have to say, but uh, we've got a great history. Let's keep it going. My philosophy on local history is remembering great people like Dr. Bradford Brown, and a lot of my high school teachers, elementary teachers, middle school teachers, and most of all my grandmother and the people in my neighborhood who spoke out to each kid, kept them out of trouble, made sure they go to school, made sure they dressed themselves, made sure they behaved right, made sure they became a success in Athens. And a lot of them have, in many ways in my generation, became successful because they are still alive today. They are making sure that their kids are doing the right things. And the history of Athens shows that when black people unite together, we stay together. But when we separate one another, we are separated. So we got to guide our lives toward doing the right thing and keeping the history of Clark County 
in a positive way, the way it used to be for us when we did the right thing in our generation. Mr. Mayor. So in the United States, really for centuries, you know, history was often told through the lens of people with wealth and power and name recognition, uh, certainly people who had you know, buildings like the Cobb House uh, built for them and named after them. Um, but my philosophy of history is that history really shouldn't be that homogenous. History should be the history of everyone, history of working people, history of people across uh, difference and race. So to recognize that somebody like Elizabeth King, who was a teacher at Bernie Harris High School, or somebody like Hattie Whitehead, who's been mentioned earlier, significant, is a history we need to embrace. And we embrace it not just because we're looking back and we're celebrating the great things done in the past by, by waves of people, but we're also drawing inspiration from those things and saying to ourselves, how can we act now? And how can we set our children and our grandchildren up for success broadly? And so I think looking at the breadth of history and asking how can we be an inclusive community is our mission now. Um, I've heard a lot tonight about the historic preservations and everything, but I'm 34 years old and I've been in Athens and I've never stepped foot in the Morton Theater. So they say a lot about, right. And I say that because our black and brown kids don't even get a chance to tour these places. They don't get a chance to learn the history, and we're forgetting that piece. Like, it's in my philosophy, if I don't know about it, how, how can I create and inherit things? So I've had to study. I had to visit. I had to, to do certain things to even gain the knowledge of what the history of Athens is. And I say that because we're forgetting the part, the educational piece that's not in the school about the history of Athens. And I'm self-taught, self-made. So it's like, if we don't know anything about the history of Athens, what are we saving? So it's, I think it's our responsibility to be able to teach the kids about the history so they can know what they're saving. And that's just my philosophy. You have to build history and community to be able to establish a better man. Looking down the road towards the future, what role should historic preservation play in the Athens Clark County? Looking down the road, I think historic preservation should play a, a huge role in the art community. I am an artist, so I just feel like if you look at other models of what people are doing in their community, they're not tearing down the history, but they're implementing it inside of their schools and inside of the things that they want to teach the individuals. Um, just earlier w with the commissioners and everybody else uh, stating the history of the buildings that has been broken down, we can't go back because it's been broken down. I, I went to Whitehead. My daughter goes to Whitehead. I, go, I went to Bernie Harris. My son goes to Bernie Harris. So we're breaking down those things that our kids want to go and attend and inherit. Um, so I just would bring more festivities, um, get the local artists to paint these buildings, making sure that the local people in art and in history are implemented in these programs, because we don't see much art in Athens. It's a, I think it's sculpture, but it's not enough art being brought, and our locals could benefit from economic development if we implement them. Well, certainly no community is going to be preserved in you know, every fiber and every iota. You know, what we don't want to do is become like a strip mall in Snellville on Highway 78. You know, we don't want to be a place that's completely anonymous. And part of our, our identity is that breadth of history that I described earlier. And that's really something that we should embrace as a community. We, we should embrace it for the social ties that it embodies. We should embrace it for the economic development opportunity that it undergirds. And we should embrace it because that connects us to each other, connects us to those who've come before us and those that are going to come after. What I'm thinking about when it's saying preserving I think Athens Clark County need to have it set up where the at will law is no longer in effect. Contact Governor Kemp, Honorable Governor Kemp, and have that law drop where people can get back to work, where people can bring in income for the whole city of Athens, Georgia. 
not just those who have it, not just just the rich, but all people have opportunity. And by doing it that way, when we drop that law, that will tell us as black people, we need to get on up and start working. We need to get our jobs going. We need to take care of our family. So along with white and other races also, we need to take particular care of our situation to make sure this never happened again, that black people are constantly losing their historic property because we are not paying taxes on it or we're walking away from it. That's what I'd say. Thank you. Um, what role should historic preservation play in the future of athens Clark County? I think uh, many items that we go through or use in our life, that we never own them. We just borrow them from God uh, or the future generation. Maybe we, we picked them up from the past generation. Um, as I said when I was on American Pickers, and I hope you review that show, um, the Doctor is Waiting was the name of it, and I met with uh, Mike and Frank, and I told them, they filmed me for about six hours, but they condensed it into about 30 minutes. And one item that they did feel necessary to put on the show was when I sat on my couch and I said, everything has value. And I believe that to this day. From the time I had a paper route and would pick up bolts and uh, pieces of metal and Coca-Cola bottles at age 10, I've collected things in my life. Buildings, houses, apartment complexes, cars, houses. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a successful man, and uh, I commend all of you who are running today. And uh, I hope that uh, we become a team that uh, changes and uh, changes Clark County and keeps a lot of it the way it is. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. What role should historical preservation play in the future? I feel that we should preserve what we have and continue to grow on what we have. And I think that will help the near future for the next generation. I see things that's coming up and I see new ways that Athens is growing. And we have to think about the next generation and how they're using technology in helping us to gain strength and knowledge through this new historical preservation. So let's continue to grow on what we have as well as when we get ready to be a new things. Okay, so right there, what adjustments, what adjustments would you make towards the local historic preservation policy? Well, my first one would be is to get back West Brock. I want that policy to be set in place that would be my first. Because when you got a first love, it's hard to get rid of your first love. And you want that first love to grow and prosper. So I don't know the policy with the Clark County School District, but as your next mayor, I will sit down with them and let's see what we can do to preserve well, not so much these the issues. Well, the well, the commu about well the the sit with the community. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. But due to the yeah. fact that I am running for mayor, That's I had to say mayor. that. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad I'm in the middle here and not having to do two questions at one time. But uh, <clears throat> um, one thing that I would um, <clears throat> advocate that needs to be done differently is how the uh, tax assessors tax our properties here. The buildings that I own downtown, which some I've owned as long as 20 years prior to recent sales, um, they go up 10 to 18 percent a year. 10 to 18 percent tax increase a year. A man who wants to uh, leave his to demolition, they don't touch his taxes. That's how you would make him do, do something to his damn building. He'd either sell it or get the hell out of there or renovate it. But uh, if you text him like you do me, he might be down here as PO'd as I am. <laughs> but uh, other things, uh, let's see. Uh, we, we do a great, 
preservation here. Athens is a historic city. It is an international city. Uh, in Europe, or I was last in Vietnam for two months with my wife, my, my new wife. Um, only my second, only my second wife, but uh, only my second. Um, and uh, I have, uh, even though I've traveled the world looking for another one, and uh, <laughs> but um, I believe I found one uh, with a different culture, a different uh, attitude, and uh, that's what's so beautiful about other countries. Uh, and uh, there's something, you know, we, we are an international city. Walk down on International Day and see who's down there on, uh, on the uh, College Avenue selling stuff or wanting to, you to know more about their country. Am I, is my time up? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> what about your international wife? I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the adjustment I would do to may add to the policy uh, preservation of uh, the local business and historic historic districts, thank you, historic districts in Clark County would be, I will make sure I will go around to every person that I know that possibly have a historic building, property, uh, business, that they understand how important to preserve it by not allowing it to slip out of their hands by not giving it away, by paying their taxes, by making sure their children have something to inherit. And by doing it that way, it's a possibility that a lot of black historic buildings would be saved today. Uh, black historic. You, you keep saying black historic buildings. I'm talking about all of that. Okay. Black I'm talking about of all. Owned by everybody. Okay. There's, You're going to be the mayor now, okay? You're going to be the mayor, so you got to look at it that way. Well, all of Athens, when I say history of black owned business, I'm. There's more than black. I know. I'm, I own one. Yeah, okay. There's more than there's another right. besides me. Okay? okay, when I speak of that, I'm speaking of not just only black people. Thank you. I'm speaking of all people. Thank you. Okay, I was getting to that. Okay, but what I need to understand and what you need to understand that we in Athens and Clark County who have historic buildings and properties that our family need to continue on preserving them in any way possible legally. It's very important to have history. And history is good for all. Even the bad history is good for people. And like good, like good history. We need to know our past and we deserve to know our past and we deserve to save things. And I'm, I'm a big person on using the term black people because I'm a black person. But we need it. We, okay. So I mentioned earlier that we know that not every fiber of every building is going to be maintained exactly in the state that it was built. Um, so I live in a 1906 mill house. Um, it did not have an indoor restroom. Um, what's now the restroom was a back porch. And so in the same way that at some point in the middle of the century, it was determined that indoor plumbing was something that was reasonable for people to have. We're also going to see some transitions in the way that we manage historic properties. You know, we've been a leader in athens Clark County in energy efficiency, and we need to support those people who live in historic properties as we transition into use of solar and really into insulating those historic properties for all of our residents. And it leads into the other thing that we need to do, which is really democratize historic preservation and make the tools of historic preservation available to everyone. It shouldn't be think, thought of as the province of just the rich or the people who lived in 4,000 square foot homes with three stories. You know, we should make sure the tools are easy to access whether you've got an 800 square foot mill house or whether you've got one of those grand houses up here on Hill Street. I think for me, uh, moving forward, the policy that I would kind of change would be more awareness, more education in what the historic properties symbolize, um, as well as implementing if those historic property owners would like to offer tours or museums to be able to know the history. So I think the policy for me would to always keep them up, like the upkeeping, um, 
up to date, but to not do away with the history piece. Um, so that's that's something I would change in the policy is offering to the city the possibility of the art, the history, and the education of awareness that it symbolizes. Great. So what are your thoughts, ma'am, on the countywide preservation assessment of the current historic sites and the, it's the current preservation policy? What, what are your thoughts on that? The assessment as well as the preservation policy surrounding that? I mean, we really would have to know what's all the historic places. Like, honestly, I'm not going to lie and say that I went and looked up every single historic place. (laughs) But, right, so I'm just, right, but it it does need to be an assessment. We need to know our value. We need to know what those um, gold mines are. We're holding a lot of revenue back, economic development back if we don't know that the assessment of those buildings. So that's that's something that I would add is adding the value, the revenue, because with venues of historic properties, you can add more revenue into your community. So a, a challenge of my time uh, in City Hall uh, as commissioner for 12 years and as mayor for three now has been that oftentimes our approach to historic preservation has been reactive that there's a threat against a building, um, that, that there's, a, there's a developer who wants to do something that we realize is not aligned with our values. And the value of a countywide preservation assessment is to say, let's be proactive rather than reactive. Let's go ahead and look at the Whitehall Mill Village. Let's look at the Puritan Mill area. Let's look at other neighborhoods, Newtown, that haven't been fully assessed. And look, let's look at other assets as well. Let's look at our historic cemeteries. Let's look at our historic physical resources like curbstones and Belgian blocks that, uh, th- that you can still see on Finley Street and recognize that there's value in those as well. And so if we do this proactively, I think we're going to have fewer of those pitched battles in City Hall where we have last minute desires to put a, an activity on hold, but instead the opportunity to say, how can we in a strategic way roll out a series of new initiatives around historic preservation? This is my first time saying that, but I agree with you on that. Um, (laughs) The assessment, I believe, of the historic properties, we need to focus on what's feasible. Not so much is what we desire, because sometimes things take a long time to get there, and we need to be patient with it. And I'm not a patient person myself. So I need to understand, as you need to understand, preserving historic property and using the assessment that we have today and the policy we have today is kind of not on the same track. We need to get on the same track of doing all this together, preserving things. Thank thank you. I, you know, every site in uh, Athens, Clark County, and everywhere is a historic site. Um, What we can measure by that is what uh, structure may exist on that historic site, or what structure might have once existed on that site. Uh, When the Civic Center was built, uh, the old fire station portion was incorporated into that, and that was a great uh, inclusion there. Um, they, they tore down the big flea market that uh, used to sit in the, um, d- in the um, uh, empty structures that were there. <laughs> but um, in the 38 years I've lived in Athens, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, and I'm sure if I live that long uh, much more, I'll see a lot of changes there too. But uh, there are some things we want to uh, preserve. We're a young country very young. I've been in buildings that have been over a thousand years old. This country, uh, the state of Georgia was formed in uh, 1803, I think. That was like yesterday. We don't have anything as old as other countries do, but they preserve those, and we should learn to do that. (laughs) Thank you. My thought on the Athens Preservation to preserve what we have I like going down, getting information on what is history 
and what is not. And I want to commend you all for keeping great records because I love to read the history and visit areas where there is history and where there's history to come. So I like for us to get together as a community and let's see what is comfortable to keep and what is not to keep. Keep that microphone on. Because there's been a great deal of local discussion about the impact of short and long-term wills in our historic neighborhood. Lord have mercy. Now, if elected, Madam Mayor, what approach would you take to navigate this issue? Marvin, let me say this. When we talk about long-term rental and short-term rental, there are some people that only need to be short-term. That's true. <laughs> and, 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 and I understand that. And, and we can't look bad on them, even though I understand those who are the renter wants their money, but we have to be a little patient with people. But I understand long and short-term in historical areas, but why is it only historical areas? That's, so. a, that's a problem that the Madam Mayor would have to talk right? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I believe uh, the designation of historical uh, neighborhoods is uh, a preface or a means by which uh, the more affluent residents of those neighborhoods want to tell other people, you can't come rent in my neighborhood, but you can rent down the street. Uh, I'm a very hated man by some people in this county. <laughs> and uh, I uh, ask a man that I've known many years, why do people hate me? And uh, he said, Fred, when you got here, you started doing a lot and you have done it forever. You've done it a long time, and they are jealous of you. Uh, what I have in my life was given to me by God and my family and my genetics. And uh, I'm just, I thank, I thank all three of them every morning I get up. I'm gonna quit talking there, but just on this subject. On long-term and short-term rentals here in Clark, okay. okay. On long-term and short-term rentals here in Clark County, I have a problem with that in my neighborhood. Yes, sir. I have both, and I had this renter come up to me and tell me it's okay for her to dump her leaves and trash on another person's property. And I said, I'll, I said that's that man's property. That's his property. You just can't dump anything on his property. But she said. It's going to rot away anyway. The only thing she was concerned about was money. And we get those type of people not from Clark County mostly, but out of county and out of state who would like to come here and do as they please with property that don't belong to them using long-term and short-term rental. And I hope the current mayor, or possibly the future mayor to be. Could that be you? It possibly can. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's, not, that's not my main focus right this moment. My main focus at this moment is that I need to let the people understand how important it is to stop the long-term and short-term rental here in Clark County because they are desolating our property, our livelihood, our way of life, the way we see things and the way we should see things. We need to get that under control. Now, as me running mayor, I'm running for mayor. That's quite sure. I'm running for mayor. But my main focus is to make sure that any other kid who do or do not have an education can see, hey, I have an opportunity to set up that like Mr. Coleman, who's running for mayor. Let me get myself together. Yes, sir. That's my main focus. My people is my main focus. More important to me as running mayor. And I had to say that because I'm sitting here. I'm telling you the truth for the whole thing. So when it comes to long-term rentals, uh, there was quite a bit that was court settled in about the 2002 and 2003 era. 
Um, longtime Clark County residents may remember that there was a pitch to create what was called a rental registration program, and that was thrown out by the courts. So to the greatest degree we can, we really need to use our code enforcement powers. I think uh, earlier Speaker Commissioner Davenport mentioned the party house ordinance that we passed just a couple of years ago to crack down on really the negative direct behavior. I mean, nobody wants to try and put their kids to bed at 9 o'clock and have somebody from out of town partying until 2 in the morning and live with that. Nobody should have to. So we've got tools at our disposal. As far as short-term rentals, there's been back and forth between localities in the state over the last several years over whether or not the state of Georgia was going to offer what's termed preemption, which is when the state says that localities cannot do certain things. Um, the state has allowed us to collect uh, taxes on short-term rental, just like on hotel beds, and so I'm very appreciative of that state action. But I think we do also need to look at the concentration of short-term rentals and make sure that we're not turning some neighborhoods into effectively Airbnb ghettos. Um, I'm a little distracted by our, our panel. <laughs> but, but for the most part, I honestly think um, when it comes to long and short term rentals, it's all about values and it's all about standards. So having a standard for that tenant when they come in, having those values. Um, and as as Mayor Gertz just stated, like just making sure that it's something in place. If you're living here for a certain amount of time, this is the standards of this neighborhood. If you're living there long term, I think there should be meetings amongst that neighborhood um, patrolling. Like it's certain things that can be in place versus what what has been discussed. I just feel like everybody deserves to be in a home, long or short, but it should be keeping up the quality of that environment should be a standard, no matter if it's long or short term. It, it should always have that value. So I just truly believe affordable housing, um, wealth, rich, you should, if you're in a, a home, make sure you have that maintenance of that home and that landlord qualifications. Um, how would you address demolition by neglect of local historic properties? Demolition by neglect of local historic properties. How would you address that? Um, I would I would honestly look more into before destroying a building. What can we do to renovate it? I I don't my philosophy honestly I don't believe in having to destroy something, um, especially with it being historic preservation. Whether it's a historic building or just well, really let's stick on historic. But I I honestly don't believe that we should destroy. I think we should reservate those things so that somebody else inheriting it can can have that value of it. So I really don't agree with destroying things because it's, it's something that you're taking away from the next generation. So I think we need to put a few new tools in our toolbox when it comes to avoiding demolition by neglect. Um, one of those things is really uh, something that could be added onto a program already under existence here at Historic Athens. And so rather than just looking at exterior supports for existing, particularly low-income neighborhoods, I think we could look at all kinds of interior renovations and utility upgrades and insulation upgrades for low-income residents who may be the owners of some of these properties. We can also add use of our land bank authority. And so one of the phenomenon that you often have, particularly in older neighborhoods, is what are termed air properties, where there might be 15 cousins that own a property in common, and nobody is really the responsible party for that property. And what the land bank authority can do is work with those cousins to to steal the title, because 13 of those cousins may be in parts unknown. And so you need to be able to do that. And it also can eliminate back taxes on those properties so that property can be put into functional use. Um, and finally, you know, there certainly are some people who own property who are in, in a sort of craven way allowing demolition by neglect to happen. And what we can do is put some strictures uh, financial strictures on those properties to incentivize them to get off the pot and let somebody use that property in a productive way in a neighborhood that's going to be enhancing to Athens-Clark County. 
The only way I believe in demolition, demolition of any kind of historic property is that building has to have the roof caving in, the walls about to fall over, has to have asbestos or some kind of destructive disorder with it. Other than that, we need to preserve, save any way we can. Recondition the wood, recondition anything we can out of that building. Put our taxpayer money together to save that for history. We need that for history if it is feasible to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think um, I've mentioned um, one, one method that could be used to uh, prevent demolition by neglect, and that's to bring in uh, those aggressive tax assessors that come uh, loose on me for, for renovating a building. Um, the Fred building had taxes uh, one time when I bought it 15 years ago of $10,000 a year. Now it's $115,000 a year on one building. Uh, some of you might remember I took my uh, tax money down there one uh, tax due day on a hand truck in $1 bills. It was uh, 450 pounds of $1 bills. Uh, they made me put it on the x-ray machine and I nearly threw my back out. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the taxes have just gone uh, out, of, out of control here. And uh, you know, they, they look at all the money they want and then they divide it by the properties they can tax. And there goes the tax assessment. <laughs> assessment. But uh, I've got a lot of uh, answers to a lot of questions, and uh, I think I'm probably finished with that one. The neglect of demolition, I just don't believe in. I'm sorry. I want every historical home to be rebuilt. I think the city has enough money somewhere in a budget that we can get together as a community and rebuild these homes if we're gonna continue to have a name called Athens Historical Preservation. Thank you. Let me say thank you all to each, you, each one of the candidates tonight for sharing their answers. We've learned a lot, am I right? <laughs> We've learned a lot. Give them a big hand.